Hi friends, welcome to Beautifully Bookish Bethany, and good morning. I am drinking my coffee and about to do a video premiere, but today we are starting an in-depth reading vlog of Throne of Glass by Sarah J Maas for the Mass Effect read-along. I'll blame being not caffeinated enough just yet, but I didn't say this is a full spoiler video, full spoilers for Throne of Glass, some spoilers, light spoilers for other series, and uh, a recap video, so enjoy. I haven't read this in many, many years, so it'll be interesting to see how it holds up. We're gonna dive into this, and if I notice Easter eggs, I will call them out. Let's do a deep dive. What works, what doesn't? I remember really enjoying this the first time that I read it. I thought it was fun. It's loosely a Cinderella retelling, but with an assassin, and I it, it was exactly what I wanted at the time that I picked it up. I don't know how it's gonna hold up, so let's give it a shot. So I have read the first two chapters and I've decided because of the kind of video I'm doing that I'm actually tabbing and like writing in Throne of Glass. I don't know that I'm going to do this for all of the books, but I think it'll be interesting to have and it's kind of a fun project. I don't do this with very many of my books, but we're doing it for this one. So let's talk about the first two chapters. I had forgotten how it opens and that Kaol is introduced pretty immediately. And I have to say, I think the opening line of book one is a good one. After a year of slavery in the salt mines of Endovir, Selena Sardothian was accustomed to being escorted everywhere in shackles and at sword point. I feel like to me that's a really solid opening line. It's intriguing. You're giving a sense of where we are. We're dropped into kind of the middle of something. We don't have to get all her backstory right away. And I, I like it. And Kaol is the person who is walking her through. So I had completely forgotten how this all starts exactly. And it's so interesting to see these characters that we get to know later on in the series really early on. In general, I think it's a really good first chapter. It's intriguing. It's throwing us into some action. And it's also giving us a lot of information about who Selena is and what kind of world we're in and setting up pieces of what we're going to be getting. She's not losing her bearings easily, even though Kaol is taking her all these places trying to confuse her. So we know she has this, some kind of a set of skills that are interesting. We do have some descriptions that feel very early 2000s. And that is I think is interesting. It's said that beneath the dirt she is frightfully pale and had been attractive once, beautiful even. And so I think that's interesting that like, oh, she's terribly pale because she hasn't been out in the sun. This does vibe with an early 2000s sort of like white people using tanning beds type thing. I feel like that was the vibe. We have some little notes uh, like Kale's sword pommel is shaped like an eagle mid-flight. There's just a lot of like little details that we're getting peppered in here, but without it feeling like an info dump, which is, is pretty good. We know he's the captain of the Royal Guard. We have the gold wyvern embroidered on his tunic, which is the Royal Seal. So we know, okay, this is a fantasy world. We have wyverns. We've got some kind of a royalty thing going on. We've got a heroine who's got some skills, who's been imprisoned. What's up? It says, how lovely it was to hear a voice like her own, cool and articulate. So we're like, okay, she's educated. I mean, this feels a little classist in the description maybe, but I think that's interesting. And then she remembers killing her first overseer. So we know that she's killed people before. So we're being told a lot about her here, but then we're also being told some things about the political system she's in. We know that there's royalty, so it's gonna be a monarchy. We're also told that the prison that she's in was created for criminals, poor citizens, and conquests from uh, conquering land. So we're in a monarchy that is trying to conquer other places. There are some class disparities happening here. They're putting poor people to work in this kind of brutal place. The, this is giving us a sense of, of what's going on. And then we're told that some of the prisoners were people accused of attempting to practice magic. So we know magic is illegal, but exists. But then not that they could, given that magic had vanished from the kingdom. So magic exists or exists dead, is illegal, and is no longer there. And now there are rebels. So there's like, there's a lot of political things 
getting set up in just a few sentences here without giving us too much detail where it feels like an info dump. This feels like just enough information to get us kind of situated to where we're at. We see that there's a lot of guards there for her, so we know she's probably dangerous. 14 guards plus the captain, all in the uniforms of the royal family's personal guard. And then we see she is standing in front of the crown parents of Adarlin. Adarlin? Adarlin? I don't know if I'm saying this right. But what a great first chapter, at least in my opinion. I think this is interesting. It's setting us up to understand a little bit about who are, who this character is, the world that we're in. It's intriguing. It makes me want to keep going. So yeah, I'm liking it. A little melodramatic. Yeah, sure. Chapter two is where we're setting up the love triangles, right? We're, we're starting the process of doing it. I'm reading from this and I was originally planning on as I'm talking about this, which maybe I will do, getting myself together for the day. I also, I have been sucked in to trying <laughs> to trying <laughs> Korean sunscreen. So I, I shout out to Jess Owens. I don't know that she mentioned this specific one. I saw it somewhere else, but I know she's talked about the fact that sh they don't burn your eyes. And I was like, you know what? Let me try this. I, this is from Beauty of Joseon. It's like a Korean sunscreen. So you have to buy it overseas because apparently the U.S. is like weird about what they allow for. You know how sunscreen here normally, if it gets in your eyes, it like burns, at least for me it does. This doesn't. It's kind of amazing. It sets into your skin really nicely. It works as a great base for makeup. I've got to say I'm impressed. So I will probably continue using this. I'm, I'm hopping on the bandwagon, y'all. So chapter two, we're starting to set up what is going to be love triangles, right? She says, Kale is not excessively handsome, but attractive. So she's noticing what he looks like. He's kind of hot. Now, you could say, listen, the girl has been in a prison camp. Why is she thinking about how attractive these people are? And I mean, fair. Is it realistic? No. Is it fun for what it is and kind of setting up our expectations that this is going to be a fantasy with romantic elements to it? Yes, I think it's doing that pretty effectively. She couldn't help finding the ruggedness of his face and the clarity of his golden brown eyes rather appealing. <laughs> and now she's aware of her own wretched dirtiness. She's like, damn, <laughs> why do I have to be around this hot dude when I'm looking a mess because I've been mining rocks without a bath? Then a couple things happen. We are introduced to Duke Parrington, who's going to be one of our big villains of the story. And, uh, you know, it starts with her not kneeling and him slamming her to the ground. That is the proper way to greet your future king. A red-faced man snapped at Selena. The assassin hissed, baring her teeth. So Selena is now, we know, an assassin. This is where we find out, oh, okay, not only is she smart, she has some skills, she's killed people in the past, she is an assassin. Okay, that's where that's introduced. The crown prince, of course, Dorian, is funny. <laughs> I like, I love how he's like, I don't quite comprehend why you'd force someone to bow when the purpose of the gesture is to display allegiance and respect. <laughs> like, dude, it's great. It's a great, it's a great opening line. I think that's excellent. Description of Duke Parrington, right, is a little bit on the nose and stereotypical for a villain. He's older, he's got thinning hair, he's large, so maybe some fat phobia woven into here. Thinning red hair and a mustache and stuff, and so we, we kind of get a sense that, like, okay, he's going to be clearly a villain of the story. And he's not there for long, he's just there long enough for us to be like, oh, he kind of sucks, we don't like this dude. But then he has to go off to a meeting with Endovier's treasurer. I think, because I don't remember exactly what happens in this, but I feel like this is probably some foreshadowing that he's into some sketchy financial stuff or something. Bribery, that seems seems like what we're maybe foreshadowing there. And then we get a little bit of Selena's background. She'd trained to be an assassin since the age of eight. Since the day the king of the assassins found her half dead on the banks of a frozen river and brought her to his keep. So that's a lot of information. Mysterious background, been found half dead at eight years old, and the king of assassins raised her to be an assassin. We don't know anything other than that. We don't know anything about the king of assassins, but it's intriguing. And we know she's got her long braid. <laughs> then we get some descriptions of Dorian, which again, we're setting up this love triangle. He has a polished smile. His eyes are strikingly blue. He's achingly handsome and couldn't have been older than 20. He has raven black hair that made her pause. All right, so we've got 
two potential love interests just in chapter two set up. We've got Kale, we've got Dorian, we've got Selena. Lots of attractive people here, right? <laughs> like that's what, that's what we're gonna get. I mean, it, it feels like a CW show. And then she thinks to herself this thing that is kind of absurd, but I'm like, this is giving us an, a, a, I think, an indication of the kind of melodrama that this book is going to be. Princes are not supposed to be handsome. They're sniveling, stupid, repulsive creatures. This one, this, oh, how unfair of him to be royal and beautiful. <laughs> like, is it kind of silly? A hundred percent. But again, I can go with the over the top melodrama. And I think that's what we're getting here. And I, you know, I'm okay with it. Then one thing that I found really interesting is we get descriptions of Selena herself. And this piece to me of just the physical p part of it feels a bit like maybe a self insert from Sarah J Mass. How long is this video going to be? It's going to be so freaking long. Sorry. So her eyes can look blue or gray or green, but her pupils have a ring of gold around them. So that's interesting. And I think that is an important Easter egg that's going to come in later in the series. And again, we're getting this in chapter two. She has golden hair. She's blessed with a handful of attractive features that compensate for the majority of average ones. And by early adolescence, she discovered with the help of cosmetics, these average features could easily match the extraordinary assets, which I think is really interesting, right? Because Sarah J. Mass similarly has this golden hair. She's got some really nice features and she uses makeup to enhance that. And I think always has used a lot of cosmetics and so I, this to me feels a lot like a, a little bit of a self-insert uh, which it was her debut novel she started writing it when she was pretty young I don't know that that's super unusual and then we hear you're a Selenia Sardothian Adderland's greatest assassin perhaps the greatest assassin in all of Aurelia I don't know if I'm saying these wrong you seem a little young <laughs> I mean, she, she is young. The ages are always off in these kinds of books, but also with YA, Six of Crows is the same thing. I feel like if you're writing for a teen audience, you're going to have young characters, even though it's like, is it believable that they did all these things by this age? Maybe not, but we're just going to go with it because that's the audience. And I feel like you kind of just have to roll with it and not worry too much about it. Suspension of disbelief. We're told that the average life expectancy in the mines is a month. That feels excessive to me, but again, very dramatic. But she's just, just got a lot of nerve in the way that she responds to them and it's very kind of brash and bold no matter her circumstances and that's something that I like about her I think some people don't like that but I find it entertaining and I don't know I like her she was always a favorite character for me and I understand why that's not everybody's cup of tea we find out she attempted to escape once killed her overseer and 23 centuries before they caught her damn she didn't expect to escape she was trying to have them kill her so she didn't have to live through this but instead they captured her and brought her back because the king wants her to suffer basically dorian looks at her with pity in his eyes again we've got this kind of maybe unrealistic melodrama that may not work for everybody but i i don't necessarily mind it i think the banter is over the top but I find it entertaining. And then finally, she is like, listen, there's something you want from me, something you want badly enough to come here yourselves. And they're like, we have a proposition for you. I'm listening. So that is the end of chapter two. So far, it's fun. I can see why I got sucked in so quickly when I was reading it initially. Is it dramatic? A hundred percent. Does it strain believability a lot? Sure. But so far, I'm having a good time, so I'm going to keep reading. I'll read a few more chapters, come back, and we'll talk about it. Okay, I read through chapter five, so I think what I'm going to do moving forward is do an update about every five to ten chapters, depending on how much there is to talk about. I will say there's a lot to cover in the first few chapters of the book, just because we're getting so much set up for the world. We're getting a lot of foreshadowing. Let's talk about it. Chapter three, we find out a little bit about what it is that they're there for. Dorian wants Selena to compete to be his father's champion. And if she got the position, she would basically be like his assassin for however many years. It's clear that Dorian is hiding something. He's not telling us everything, but he does say that if she does this, she could get her freedom. Selena ends up negotiating it down to four years. If she wins and serves for four years as the champion, 
for both Dorian and his father, then she'll be freed. And of course she's going to take this offer. We do get a moment at the beginning of chapter three where the prince's eyes linger a bit too long on her body and Selena is like, I could rake my nails down his face. But also the fact that he even bothered to look at her when she was in, still in such a filthy state. Hmm. So I mean, like a little creepy, but okay, we're going to go with it again. We're, we're setting up the romantic potential subplots here. We're told that she'll be training in the glass castle, which we're going to find out more about. We don't really know what that is yet, but she'd be given the title of Otterland's assassin and get a salary. One thing that's interesting here is we find out that almost nobody knows who she actually is because nobody knew that Selena Sardothian was a young woman. They all thought she was much older and they decided to keep it that way. What would our enemies say if they knew we'd all been petrified of a girl? So it's very like girl power vibes type thing. I mean, I think this fits for this era of feminism, girl power feminism. That's definitely what we're fitting into here. There is a line that I thought was kind of silly. You kept your identity a secret all the years you were running around killing everyone. You know, just as one does, running around killing everyone everyone. I understand the criticism here where people say that there's a lot of telling rather than showing how great of an assassin Selena is. I think that that is a fair criticism to make. I don't know that it's something that particularly bothers me because I'm kind of here for the vibes, but I think it's a fair criticism. Chapter four, Selena is taken and bathed and given a bed to sleep in and given dinner. And there's a few things that, that we see in this chapter. One is we get an inkling of the kind of cozy slice of life type moments that Sarah J Maas likes to include in her writing. That's something that personally I love from her. I like that she does these little moments that are the experience of eating or bathing or sleeping or quiet or quiet moments that aren't necessarily furthering the plot. That is something I really enjoy from her. I know not everybody feels that way. But what we're also seeing is the physical ramifications of all this time in the mine. She has scars, she has open wounds, she's been somewhat starved and so she's very thin. Her breasts once well formed, they were now no larger than they'd been in the midst of puberty. <laughs> so a little bit dramatic, but we see that she's having trouble even keeping richer food down because of what her diet had been. But she's like, listen, I'm going to eat, I'm going to get healthy, I'm going to exercise, we're going to get back into shape. Clearly with the impact of the mines physically, she's going to need some time to recover and get back into shape to do what they want her to do. She also has trouble sleeping on the bed, ends up sleeping on the floor because of what she's been used to. We get a moment, which we're going to get more of this in the series, where she gets to wear this fine riding habit and thinks about how she loves clothes, the feeling of silk, velvet, satin, suede, chiffon, the grace of seams, intricate embroidery. And this is another thing that I've seen some people criticize, that they don't really like the fact that she's the supposedly this badass assassin who likes fancy dresses and chocolate. But personally, that's something that I always loved about this book. I love the fact that you can have this intense femininity, but also this brutality and viciousness. I'm a fan of that combination. So I know not everybody feels that way, but I like the fact that she wants luxury, but then can also go off somebody. I don't know, that works for me. And there are definitely examples of people historically who were spies or assassins who liked luxury. So I don't know that it is actually unlikely. I feel like this, especially for the time period, was one of few books that was kind of pushing back on this idea that in order to be this badass girl, you also had to not be feminine. And I appreciated at the time that I read this, especially, I think we've seen more of this now since then. But I think at the time this came out, that was a really big departure from what we were typically getting. And I liked that Selena is this blend of, you know, high femme lap of luxury while also being a badass. I, that was something I liked about it. We see that animals really like her. So Dorian's dogs are like licking her and love her. And he's like, oh, how unusual for them to notice you. Did you give them food? She didn't. But again, this is going to be a bit of foreshadowing. It's something important. We get a little bit of banter with Dorian that I think is entertaining. I think she did. we just get a lot of like good banter and then they're going off, you know, riding on horses. She's constantly thinking of how to escape and Kale is like watching her like a hawk because of course he is. And then as they go into the forest, we get a, kind of this chunk of world building information. We find out that there is a fallen witch kingdom. Selena had once met a young woman from that cursed land and though she turned out to be both cruel and bloodthirsty, she was still just a human and had still blood like one. So this is foreshadowing the witches that are going to end up being important. This is cluing us in 
into something that we don't know a lot about, but it's it's going to be it's going to be a big thing later on. We get more information about how this is a colonial kingdom that is conquering places and burning them to the ground, and the idea that this is, although not perfectly done, going to be to a certain extent an anti-colonial narrative. I don't I don't know. I it it is it is a very like early 2000s version of an anti-colonial narrative. So I don't, I, you know, like criticisms could could be fair for this, but I think we see it here. And then there's a ton of banter between her and Kale that I just think is hilarious. I love them together. She likes to push his buttons. He's super gruff and grumpy, but she'll wear him down. And in chapter four, we get the start of that. And I find it super entertaining. I love Kale and I love their vibe with each other. We find out that Kale is 22. He's very young. He was 20 when he became captain of the Royal Guard and she is 18. So we're kind of placing where what are the ages they're all of age which is important for a YA book that is eventually going to have sexual content <laughs> not in this book but in a later book but uh yeah all right chapter five we see that Dorian and Parrington don't have a cordial relationship so again we know that he's being set up as a villain of some sort there's not a great relationship there so we'll see more of that we get descriptions with jewels Sarah does like to do these jewel descriptions in her writing so the leaves dangled like jewels tiny droplets of ruby pearl topaz amethyst emerald and garnet this is a bit excessive right we're just a list of a list of jewels that the leaves could look like is this the best writing? No. Do I care that much? It, no, but it's it's whatever. We also get a little more backstory here on Selena. We find out that the King of Assassins is named Arabin Hamel or Hamel. He was her mentor. He saved her when he found her on the shores near Terrasen, which is where she's from. We're going to learn more about Terrasen later on, but he never let her go back home. And if she had refused to be mentored by him, he probably would have let her die. We find out about Terrasen though. She still remembered the beauty of the world before the King of Otterlin had ordered so much of it burned. So her homeland was conquered and burned by the king who she she now is supposed to be potentially fighting for. On page 30, they're in the forest. She says, this isn't just any forest, it's Brannon's forest. Brannon, that's interesting that this early on, we're getting mentions of people who are going to be important later on in the series. So take note of that. So we had King Brannon and he's like, oh, it used to be full of fairies. They're all gone now, along with those damned wretched fae. We got rid of them, didn't we? And she's like, watch your tongue. King Brannon was fae and Oakwald is still his. I wouldn't be surprised if some of the trees remember him. The soldiers laugh at her for this, but this is going to be something that's important. We learn that Fae are immortal. This place once had had a bunch of fairies, gnomes, sprites, nymphs, goblins, etc., ruled by larger human-like cousins, the immortal Fae, the original inhabitants and settlers of the continent. Okay, but the king was hunting them down and executing them, so they fled, seeking shelter in the wild, untouched places of the world, and he outlawed all of it. Magic, fey, fairies removed any trace so thoroughly that even those who had magic in their blood almost believed it had never really existed. Selena herself being one of them. Okay, so we're we're getting told here that Selena has magic in her blood right? Like this, like people, this is what I think is so interesting, right? This is page 31. So <laughs> the foreshadowing starts so early. We're kind of being told things that are important. And so it shouldn't be that much of a surprise when we find out what we find out later on. Like we're, we're kind of getting clued into it from the get-go. One thing I wonder about that I think is interesting is I know Sarah is Jewish and there is this description of what he did to the Fae, um, smelling the fires that had raged throughout her eighth and ninth years, the smoke of burning books, chock full of ancient irreplaceable knowledge, the scream of gifted seers and healers as they've been consumed by the flames, the storefronts and sacred places shattered and desecrated and erased from history. I wonder if this is inspired by Kristallnacht because it sounds very similar and I wouldn't be surprised if she's drawing on some of her own family history with that to talk about the way that the Fae were being treated and kind of stamped out. I think there's definitely some kind of a connection there between Jewish history and what she's writing here, which is interesting. Last thing for that chapter is when she wakes up in the forest, small white flowers lay at the foot of her cot and many infant-sized footprints led in and out of the tent and she destroys the tracks before anyone could notice. So some of the small fairies that are still hiding in that forest know her. 
something's up there. There's something important about her. We don't know her true identity, but like we're five chapters in and that's a lot. <laughs> So yeah, I will be back once I've read the next five or so chapters and we'll check in. It's the next day and I've gotten through the next five chapters. Because I'm doing so much writing in the book as I'm going, I'm listening to other books in between just because it's really time consuming. I had an event last night, which was fun. But let's talk about chapters six through ten. One thing that I'll say is that it's fast paced. It's very easy to read and get into. And she's doing a ton of foreshadowing and setting pieces for a mystery in place. I didn't realize because I've never re done a reread of it how much she does that. From the beginning there are so many little clues and easter eggs and references to things that will make sense later on. So chapter six after traveling for a couple of weeks she's now apparently feeling better. I guess traveling for two weeks was enough <laughs> for her to heal and eat food to not be starving. Okay. But they arrive to Rifthold and the glass castle, which is are these like crystalline towers and bridges and chambers and turrets and etc. And I think what's interesting is that we learn later it's this glass addition that's been built on top of an old stone castle and it creeps Selena out. She says it's because of the glass that it seems like it could all come tumbling down and there's a moment where later on where she's talking to Kale and he's like it's as strong as like stone or metal. She's like yeah till something heavier comes and crashes it all down. So again moments of like her being aware of something that that may not happen for a long time but will. I think she also says it looks greenish. Oh yeah it says the illuminated castle rose from the sleeping city like a mound of ice and steam. There was something greenish about it and it seemed to pulse. There's also a time later on when she meets the king that there's this creepy fireplace and the fire also seems greenish so we are seeing these things that there's something off. There's something not quite right here. We find out she'd first seen the glass castle eight years ago so when she was 10 years old all dressed up. She had already been an assassin at this point. It says she killed a man three days earlier. So from pretty early on she was getting pulled into this life. And we find out that she thinks one of her own betrayed her. I never trusted most of them and I knew they hated me. She had her suspicions of course and the one that seemed most likely was a truth she wasn't yet ready to face. Not now, not ever. Again we're foreshadowing something about the person who betrayed her. That is information that's going to come out later but we're getting hints at it and she continuously does this. There's also a line on page 37 it says she didn't wish to reign over the city again. Magic was dead. The Fae were banished or executed and she would never again have anything to do with the rise and fall of kingdoms. She wasn't fated for anything not anymore. So clearly she is and was fated for something. Again, clues that she's more than she seems. There's some kind of a background going in. Chapter seven, we're coming into Rifthold. We find out that it is a port city. It is along the ocean. Dorian is clearly a playboy. He's like moves from lover to lover and all the women are into him. That's a thing that we continuously see. There are occasionally descriptions in Sarah's writing that I'm like, what? <laughs> What does that mean? So like one example is it talks about uh, window displays, lines of sparkling jewelry and broad rimmed hats clumped together like bouquets of flowers. I'm like what does that mean? Why would you clump hats and jewelry together like flowers? I, I don't know. Sometimes she has these weird descriptive things and I'm like mm, okay. We see that there's enslavement that's been happening, prisoners of war, criminals, etc. and they're doing a lot of free labor. We hear briefly that she had done something nearly two years ago freeing almost 200 slaves from the pirate lord. Again some history that we'll see more about later on but we see what her intentions are. I will say so far in this book I am seeing a little bit of and to be fair a lot of books were doing this at the time but a little bit of this kind of not like other girls thing seeing a lot of other women as being kind of petty and catty and stuff like that. And I think it's interesting to contrast that with what Sarah is writing now where there's a lot more deep female friendships in the lives of characters. I, I just I think it's interesting. The Royal Guard's armor is tarnished 
which is a, an interesting fact. And one thing that we consistently see is Selena is constantly planning. She's constantly trying to figure out escape routes, constantly thinking about how she could kill people if she needed to get out. It's like her brain is always doing that. We have another moment of foreshadowing. She makes it to her chambers where she's going to be staying and it says something about the dimensions seemed a little off, something with the height of the walls, but she couldn't be sure. Like, put a pin in that because that's going to end up being important. She's not wrong. Her senses are always picking up on stuff that she may not consciously be aware of. We get a lot of clothing descriptions happening in these chapters, and I really love them. I know some people are not a fan, but I love the descriptions of all these beautiful, luscious dresses and things. I think it's fun. We find out more about Dorian and his family. Sometimes Dorian forgot how little he looked like his father. It was his younger brother Holland who took after the king with his broad frame and his round sharp eyed face. But Dorian, tall, toned and elegant, bore no resemblance to him. And then there was the matter of Dorian's sapphire eyes. Not even his mother had his eyes. No one knew where they came from. Again, this is going to be important. We have constantly foreshadowing moments of giving us clues and hints at things to come and I didn't realize how much of it there was. There's so much of it. It's wild. We see Dorian interacting with his father. Dorian pushes back on stuff. His dad is like don't get anyone pregnant until you've married somebody powerful and had some grandkids then do what you want. Dorian says, when I'm king, I won't declare control over Terrison through thin claims of inheritance. So clearly he disagrees with some of the political moves of his father. The king also tells him to stay away from Selena. Though she may look pleasant, she's still a witch. You are to keep your distance, understood? Which of course we know Dorian's not going to. Chapter eight, we hear a little bit more about Holland, the 10 year old younger brother Prince. He sounds like he's probably psychotic, so we should be concerned. Kaol is taking Selena on a tour of the castle and she sees the clock tower, which makes an awful noise. This is also important foreshadowing information. From the garden sprouted a tower made of inky black stone. Two gargoyles, wings spread for flight, perched on each side of the four clock faces, soundlessly roaring at those beneath. What a horrible thing, she whispered. He all admits he wouldn't go near it as a child. And she says, you'd see something like this before the gates of word, not in a garden. How old is it? The king had it built around Dorian's birth. Okay, so again, this is going to be important. We don't know yet what the gates of word are. We don't know what the deal with this clock tower is, but th there's something significant here. And the king was involved in having it built when Dorian was born. There's also this symbol that's like a circle with a line, a hooked line through the middle of it. And the gargoyle seems to be pointing at it. And it sounds like there's probably other symbols. We're introducing mystery and the sense that something's not quite right here. Something's up. We have things that need to be unpacked. For me, this is really effective even as a first time reader because it's drawing you into the story. There's a lot of threads that you're like, what's going on? I'm curious to read on and find out more. We get the classic Beauty and the Beast style giant library, which I always I always love as a bookworm. I'm, I'm always a fan of that. And Selena, of course, loves reading because of course she does. Why not? There's this part there's this part that's interesting because I think it's indicative of who Selena used to be and the fact that she wasn't she wasn't a peasant. Basically, Kaol says, oh, you said you're from Terrison. Did you ever visit the great library of Orinth? They said it's twice the size of this. And she says, yes, when I was very young, though they wouldn't let me explore. The master scholars were too afraid I'd ruin some valuable manuscript. Like, clearly she wasn't just a nobody if she's visiting the great library of Terrison and talking to the master scholars, right? We get this really cute moment of her writing to ask Dorian for some books. And he's like, yeah, here's seven books that I read and loved. Tell me what you think of them. I love the book sharing. It's cute. Then we're introduced to Lady Caltaine. And we don't get her name until later. But Selena sees her and her ladies in the courtyard and overhears them. We hear through a conversation that Duke Parrington is courting her, even though he's much, much older, and she's clearly not interested. Again, this is going to be important. Her and the other girls that are with her seem kind of silly and petty. So again, it's kind of setting her up as different. She's also pissed because she's heard about Selena and she's like, the princess harlot won't be well received. But then there's a moment that I think is an important detail for later on that again is giving us an indication that something is off and it's foreshadowing something to come where she says, I need my pipe. I feel a headache coming on. 
note that because there is something to do with that that's going to be important. We have some moments that Selena's a little bit whiny. I can see why it might annoy people. I'm kind of whatever about it, but I get it. And then she finally meets the king, sees all of her fellow competitors, and we find out this is going to be a gamified challenge. Over the next 13 weeks, they're going to live in the castle, they're going to train every day, be tested once a week, and each week there will be a test that will eliminate one person until the week after Yulmas, the four remaining champions will face each other in a duel to win the title. And the king is going to be gone until Yulmas. So he will not be overseeing it. We don't know where he's going or what it is that he's doing, but he's going to be gone for three months, I guess. That's kind of long. And if it wasn't clear that the king is the villain, we have Selena saying, murderer. He should be hanging from the gallows. He had killed many more than she, people undeserving and defenseless. He destroyed cultures, destroyed invaluable knowledge, destroyed so much of what had once been bright and good. His people should revolt. Aurelia should revolt. Throughout this, I think the banter with Kaol and Dorian is fun. We have a moment where Kaol tells her she looks pretty. It's cute. I'm enjoying it. After she officially meets Lady Caltaine, who is very catty about everything, she tells Kaol, I hate women like that. They're so desperate for the attention of men, they'd willingly betray and harm members of their own sex. And I mean, like, I think that's a fair concern, but also she needs some girlfriends. Like, I... I don't love the sort of not like other girls thing, even though I know it was common at the time. So that is where we're at. I'm going to go read the next five or 10 chapters and then check back in. This is going to be a freaking long video. Okay, I read the next 10 chapters. We're going to go through it chapter by chapter a little bit more quickly than before. But I'll say that in general, I'm kind of flying through it. I'm having fun with it. Okay, so chapter 11, Selena stayed up till four o'clock reading the night before her first thing, which was kind of dumb, but I, I, I've been there. <laughs> One thing that I think is important is that we find out the name of Knox, who is one of her competitors. He's the slightly handsome young man with gray eyes. We find out more about him later, but he seems to be the only one who sees Selena for who she is to a certain extent or like recognizes her as actual competition and at one point says he thinks that she'll win the whole thing. So he I think is an interesting character. We meet all of the other competitors. One of them is super creepy, Kane. He's really big. He gives creep vibes. And he is definitely a front runner, and that's going to be important as we go through. We get a lot of Selena and Kale's banter back and forth, and I think it's really entertaining. I kind of enjoy their dynamic. Like, for instance, you don't need me to rescue you. It still would have been nice. You can fight your own battles. <laughs> Like he's not wrong. I think it's funny. So we get to see Selena being good at using weapons in that chapter. Not a lot happens though. Chapter 12, we are introduced to the weapons master, Theodis, 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 I think Theodis Brulo. So Brulo is the weapons master and the judge of the competition. And he's the one who's going to be overseeing them. We find out that Kane, the creepy competitor guy is originally from the White Fang Mountains and that is another place that has been overtaken by Otterlin. So many of them had rebelled against Otterlin, most wound up dead. What would his fellow mountain dwellers say if they could see him now? She gritted her teeth. What would the people of Terrason say if they could see her now? So we have a lot of people from conquered countries who are here and there's clearly some like mixed feelings there's a lot of a lot of stuff going on we're meeting all of the different com competitors that she has she kind of looks down on all the other assassins she's like they're not even in the assassins guild Arabin Hamel would not even let them in. One thing that struck me when I was looking at his name, Hamel or Hamel, this is spoilery, but we're going full spoilers in this video, sounds a little bit similar to Hamish, who is a villain in Jewish history and, you know, kind of betrays people. So I do wonder if that's where that name comes from. I don't know, but it, it I'm curious. We get a reference to the silent assassins of the Red Desert and a note that she had spent a month training with them one burning summer and her muscles still ached at the memory of their grueling exercises. That is going to come back in the series. We're going to see more about that. The last assassin called Grave makes her pause. So he seems a little creepier. He's called Slight and Short with a wicked face that made people look away. He's got an oily smile. He's just kind of a creep. So he's he's one to keep an eye out for. She wants to show off and Kale is like, no, 
you are going to be exactly in the middle of the pack, let them underestimate you, and then you're going to win it. And her pride hates this, but also she's like, okay, but this is smart. <laughs> so <laughs> this is throughout the book, I feel like we keep getting her being like, but I want to show them how good I actually am and purposely restraining herself so that they're like, she's just a pretty girl. So then they all go and do a run with all of the competitors. She stays in the middle of the pack. Chapter 13, we kind of skip through the rest of the training montage. One thing I do like about her writing in most of her books, uh, there are some exceptions, is that usually we don't get a lot of excessive action scenes. We kind of skip ahead to some of the quieter character moments. We get some action, enough to give you a taste of what's going on. Now, I feel like this would be a negative for people who love action and want more of it and find this boring, but as somebody who goes to her largely for the cozy character moments and some of the mystery elements and stuff. I, I kind of like it. Another thing that struck me reading this is I had forgotten the throne of glass is a murder mystery. <laughs> essentially, because people in the castle start dying. And we'll get there in some future chapters. But I remember when I read House of Earth and Blood, I was like, oh, this is cool. This is a little different from her. It's formatted as a murder mystery. I don't think she's done that before. But I am wrong. Throne of Glass is also essentially a murder mystery, which look at that. Okay, we've got talking about books. Oh, okay. And then we meet Nehemia. Listen, justice for Nehemia Y'all know she ends up getting killed off, which is a shame. She's the one real character who is a woman of color, and she is such a great character. I love her. And then unfortunately, the way she's used in the story, which we're, we're not there yet, but her death is there to further the plot of the main character of the series, which really does suck. And I think that that is an understandable criticism that people have had of this series. I do think that Sarah also has recognized that and taken it to heart and has not done the same thing in her more recent writing. But that said, Nehemia is a fantastic character and I love the friendship that she and Selena, we're calling her Selena still, develop through the course of this book. So she's an Aylway woman. So she's described as having creamy brown skin. She's got this beautiful dress. She is a princess. And she is a force to be reckoned with. It says that Selena knew the name because she'd heard Elway slaves in Endovier boast of Nehemia's beauty and bravery, the light of Elway who would save them from their plight, Nehemia who might someday pose a threat to the king of Otterland's rule over her home country when she ascended the throne. Nehemia, they whispered, who smuggled information and supplies to the rebel groups hiding in Elway. She reminds me a little bit of like a Princess Leia type character. I wish that they had that she hadn't I really wish she hadn't gotten killed off because she's such a good character. They could have done Sarah could have done so much more with her in the series if that hadn't been the direction. But it is fun to see her meet Selena, see them kind of hit it off because Selena can speak her language and it's the most entertaining thing. Caltaine, of course, is pissed that she can't understand what they're saying. She's such a brat. But I do think that later on we start getting indications that Caltaine is more than she seems. And I like that. I like that it's subverting that there's this woman who seems like a certain thing but ends up being more complicated. There, you know, like there's some things, this isn't a perfect book, but there's quite a bit that I like about it. About Nehemia, her fingers are surprisingly calloused in all the spots where the hilt of a sword or dagger might rest, so she's trained in weaponry. And Selena says she'd never had many friends. The ones she'd had often disappointed her, sometimes with devastating consequences, as she'd learned that summer with the silent assassins of the Red Desert. They're coming up again. After that, she'd sworn never to trust girls again, especially girls with agendas and power of their own. Girls who would do anything to get what they wanted. Selena wondered, looking at Nehemia, if she'd been wrong. So again, we're getting this thing that is, to a certain extent, undercutting this not like other girls, don't need friendship with other girls trope, which I do like, right? That she'd sworn never to trust them again, but maybe she's wrong and she's got this developing friendship. We find out that some of the royal hounds had gone missing and their half-eaten remains were found in the northern wing of the palace. That's going to be important. And then we move on to chapter 14. This is a lot of training. We do have an important thing that happens on page 106 where Kane comes into training wearing a large ring of black iridescent stone. Strange that he'd wear it to practice. Hmm. That, that must be important. It's 
going to be important later on, right? So that this is where we start to get that piece introduced is around 100 pages in. And then we find out that Bill Chastain, the eye eater, who is one of the competitors, was found dead this morning. His innards had been taken out, his brain was missing, it was pretty gruesome, and he had been killed in the castle. So again, we're starting to get this murder mystery element of the plot. Selena and Knox start to develop somewhat of a friendship that I think could lead to maybe a partnership. She seems to like him. She shows him how to throw a dagger correctly. And he is from the same country she is from, Perinth, which is Terrace's second largest city. And so even though she's lying about who she is and where she's from for the sake of the tournament, I think she has soft feelings towards him because they're from the same country. And if I'm not mistaken, Knox ends up being important throughout the series. So there's more going on here. This is an important relationship that's going to be more than it seems, but they are both from Terrison. It does say it had been 10 years since Terrison met its doom with bowed heads and silence. We also know it was 10 years since she was found half dead by the king of assassins and so again like there was definitely something happening with when when her homeland was overthrown and when she was found then in this chapter we also get a good bit of kaol's background and this i think is interesting he's funny he's like don't you ever do anything other than read <laughs> i'm like relatable do i ever do anything other than read sometimes <laughs> But she's like, hey, you and Dorian seem close. Apparently they were really good friends when they were kids. They played together, trained together. And then when he was 13, his family moved their family back to their home in Anil, the city on the Silver Lake. The citizens of Anil were warriors from birth and had been guardians against the hordes of wild men from the White Fang Mountains for generations. The White Fang Mountain Men had been one of the first peoples to be put down by Otterland's conquering armies, and very rarely did their rebels make it to slavery. She'd heard tales of mountain men killing their wives and children, then themselves, rather than be taken by Otterland. And remember, Cain is from the White Fang people, the kind of creepy guy who's her competitor with the ring on his finger. Kale says, I was slotted to join the royal council like my father. He wanted me to spend some time among my people and to learn whatever it is councilmen learn. He said with the king's army now in the mountains, we could move our interests from fighting the mountain folk to politics. But I missed Rifthold. So Dorian convinced the captain of the guard to take me as his apprentice with the help of Brulo. My father refused, so I abdicated my title as Lord of Anil to my brother and left the next day. So he was originally supposed to be the heir. He left to join the guard. And that is how he ended up where we are. So of course, he's like, well, tell me more about yourself. What do your parents make of their daughter being Otterland's assassin? My parents are dead. They died when I was eight, which is when Terrison was overthrown. She was born in Terrison, became an assassin. And then she tells this kind of horrific story about how when she was 12, Arabin Hamel decided she wasn't as skilled at swordplay with her left hand and said either he could break my right hand or I could do it myself. She did it herself. It's pretty awful and she still has a scar from it. Brutal. But we're getting a sense of her childhood. Chapter 15. They have their first competition where someone's going to get eliminated. It is an archery competition. Knox does pretty well. Kane does very well. Selena restrains herself but still does pretty well. Chapter 16. She talks about her time in Endovier in the mines and it says that she suspects Perhaps somehow Arabin had bribed the guards in Endovia for her safety. That seems significant. One of the competitors tries to run away and is shot in the head for trying to escape. So don't try to escape or you're going to die. Chapter 17. We meet the queen for the first time. Dorian has been called to his mother's court and she wants to get him married off. He wants nothing to do with it, but she's like, here are some possibilities. Here's a list of ladies. Look into them. She's like, a princess would be preferred. There are no princesses left. Except for the princess Nehemia. <laughs> Don't worry, I wouldn't force you to marry her. I'm surprised her father allows for her to still bear a title. The impetuous haughty girl. Do you know she refused to wear a dress I sent her? But he clearly seems to like her. I'm sure the princess has her reasons, disgusted by his mother's unspoken prejudice. So though mom seems racist, Dorian's like, ew. <laughs> um, she says it's a pity Lady Caltaine has an agreement with Duke Parrington. She's such a beautiful girl and polite. Perhaps she has a sister. And Dorian's like, ew, no, he's bored. 
bored of these women, bored of these cavaliers who masqueraded as companions, bored of everything. So he is our bored, privileged prince who doesn't want to get married. His mom's trying to marry him off. He's going to have a growth arc through this, though. And she mentions Rosamond, he, who broke his heart, and he's still sulking over her, so he must have fallen in love with someone. And then she left him for a boorish husband. It's very interesting. Love this because Dorian happens upon Selena sparring with Nehemia and freaks out. He's like, she can't be sparring. And he's like, well, I'll, I'll teach her swordplay. You know, she already knows swordplay, but he's like, yeah, I'll, I'll do it. Chapter 18, we find out about the existence of Sam, Selena's first love, who apparently died right before she ended up in Endovier. This is, again, going to be a critical, important thing. Assassin she'd grew up with, childhood best friend, lover, etc. Kaol shows up and is freaking out, freaks out the Nehemia sparring with Dorian, gets them all out of there. Chapter 19, we are back with Caltane, and this is where we learn that there is more to her than meets the eye. Something's up with her. She's got some things planned. So Parrington is super creepy with her, but it says she convinced him to invite her to court, mostly by implying what might await him once she was out of her father's household. And without a chaperone, it hadn't be difficult. So she's plotting. She's more than she seems. He didn't hide he wanted her, but he hadn't pushed her into bed yet. But he, man like him always got what he wanted. So she's manipulated Parrington to get her into court. It seems that she is plotting to end up married to Dorian. This is going to be an important plot point later. Then she starts causing trouble, implying that Lady Lillian, which is what the name that Selena is going by, uh, her pseudonym, has some kind of a thing developing with the prince that maybe he's in love with her and Parrington freaks out indicating that that's impossible and he doesn't like her which makes Caltain think what's the deal why does he dislike her so much this is gonna cause problems. Lastly, chapter 20, we find out that Selena is an amazing piano player because of course she is. She's sad about Sam. He, like her, had been betrayed. Sometimes the absence of him hit her so hard she forgot how to breathe. So she's missing him, playing music. Dorian comes in, hears her playing. They have a whole conversation. And she says, I think that you came to get me because you want adventure and you're bored, which I mean, she kind of pegged him right. Yeah. I mean, he's saying he's bored with all of this. He wants something more exciting. As someone who gave me the crown of a hero to read, which suggests a rather fanciful mind that yearns for adventure. I don't think you're an adventure, he muttered. Oh, the castle offers so much excitement that the presence of Otterland's assassin is nothing unusual. But she's like, I'm already at your father's disposal. I won't become his son's jester too. And he kind of blushes about it. He does ask with the song that she had been playing if she was thinking of a former lover. She's like, yes. And he's like, oh, he doesn't live in the castle, does he? And she's like, good night. His name was Sam. What happened? He died. When? 13 months ago. Okay. That's where we're at. People are dying in the castle. We've got lots of political machinations and plotting going on, lots of characters, a love triangle, and uh, mis mysterious things. So I'll probably read another 10 chapters, and then I will check back in and we'll talk about them. We have now made it through another 10 chapters. I'm more than halfway through the book, and I'm ready to discuss. But before I get into the more chapter-by-chapter -chapter detail, overall thoughts on this is it's fun. There is a lot of foreshadowing. I'm enjoying the mystery. However, I can definitely see where people are coming from with some of the criticisms that I've seen leveled against this. So for instance, Selena is sometimes kind of whiny, a little bit juvenile. It is also the case that while we are told that she is this amazing assassin, we don't really see her do amazing assassin things and the way that she reacts to people being jerks to her is a little bit juvenile. So I can see the criticism of that. If you're going into this wanting like this really cool assassin character, you don't entirely get that in Throne of Glass. I will very much still stand by my feelings about her being very feminine. I think she can be that and also be a badass assassin. But <laughs> I do think that the way that she reacts to people upset with her is a little juvenile and isn't what I would expect from a character with her background and training. So I think that is a fair criticism to make. 
Is it significantly harming my enjoyment of the book? No, but I can totally see how if that's a pet peeve of yours, it may. So let's look at chapter 21. We've had another death, another champion has died. I think I mentioned this last time, but again, we are getting a murder mystery in this book and I am enjoying it. I had forgotten that this was so much of a murder mystery. Selena is dangling from the stone wall of a castle. She has to climb up it for the latest challenge. One competitor falls and dies. She could have won, but instead she saves Knox. It has his rope cut by another competitor. Chapter 22 is when she actually saves him. Not much happens in chapter 21. She's both happy she saved him and upset because she placed 18th and Kale's like 18th place is fine. At least Knox placed behind you and she's like oh, but I could have won. <laughs> so she really struggles with that. She says Arabin told me that second place was just a nice title for the first loser. And this is where Kaol is like, wait, what? Arabin Hamel, the king of the assassins? She says, he trained me himself. He brought in tutors from all over Aurelia. Once he sent me to the silent assassins in the red deserts, etc. He didn't bother to tell me until I was 14 that I was expected to pay him back for all of it. So trained her, made her pay for it. She mentions that this also happens to girls in brothels. And he's like, did you pay it back? Oh, down to the last copper. And then he went and spent all of it. Over 500,000 gold coins gone in three hours. We're going to get that information later, what happened exactly, but that is quite a moment. Yeah, and again, champion who didn't show, show up for that test had been found dead in a servant's stairwell, brutally mauled and dismembered. Chapter 23. Selena's having nightmares, which given her history, not shocking. We get a, an important moment, sort of foreshadowing, I guess, but sh there's an odd draft from somewhere in her room, smelling strangely of roses. Again, remember when she first got into that room, she was like, hmm, something seems off about these dimensions. Now there's a strange draft smelling of roses. What could it be? And this is happening on the day of Samhain. Uh, Samhain? Sam Samhain? 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 I don't know how to pronounce this, but it's basically like Halloween, essentially, where the spirits are are more around and so some things are going to happen. We're hearing in passing about more of the tests, but it's not the primary focus of the book. We had one that was throwing a javelin from horseback. I don't mind this. I think there are some people who might be annoyed that we're just hearing about the tests instead of experiencing most of the tests. I don't want to experience most of the tests. I am less interested in that part, honestly, so I don't mind this choice, but it may or may not work for other people. We've got more with Nehemia. It says Parrington had been pushing for them to take Nehemia as a hostage. Dorian's like, no, not particularly inclined to add hostage taking. And it, this is interesting. Dorian says, if he were anyone but the crown prince, he would warn Nehemia. But if she left before she was supposed to, the duke would know who had told her and inform his father. So he's not going to tell her she's in danger, even though he probably should. Nehemia is great, by the way. I continue to love her character and the stuff that she says. She wants Selena to teach her how to speak and write and read her language better so that she can be fluent. And is like an hour every day before supper. Of course, Kale and Dorian don't really want that to happen, but she pushes for it and it works out. We've got more on the clock tower. It says, it's black and menacing as always, but kneeling before it was Cain, his head bent focused on something on the ground. Weird. Kane, Kane continues to be a weird character here. This part is important. His hands were covered in dirt. He's acting strangely. He gets up and leaves and Selena looks at the spot where he'd been kneeling. He had dug out the dirt packed into the hollows of the strange mark in the flagstone to make the mark clearer. What do you think this is? A word mark? So it's a word mark, a triangle inside a circle. And Selena's like curious about this. How strange can you read these? And Nehemia's like, no, they're part of an ancient religion that died long ago. Nehemia says you should leave it alone. Things like this were forgotten for a reason. She's warning her, listen, leave it alone. It's not safe. Does Selena pay attention? No, of course not. Then there's an interesting moment where Nehemia is staring at Selena's forehead and seems to be seeing something that's not there. And she's like, you're hiding something. You are much more than you seem. What is it that she sees? Something. Chapter 24. This is where we finally find out what's up with her room and that rose scented breeze that this is again, the night of Halloween, essentially ye fantasy Halloween. She's looking at the tapestry in her room of a woman who is beautiful with silver hair, a young face and a flowing white gown. And then 
she's like, did the tapestry sway slightly? Hmm. Could it be? Yes, of course, there is a secret door hidden behind the tapestry. I love a good hidden passage in a story like this. I think it's great. So she gets some yarn and chalk and candlesticks and goes to explore because of course she does. So she gets to this room where there's three doorways. One of them goes to the sewer system with some little boats tied. So this is probably a forgotten escape route for the king, which is interesting. But she decides not to try to escape. She goes back and there are two passages remaining. One of the passages blows wind with whispers beneath the breeze and she decides uh, following whispers on this night is only gonna lead to trouble and chooses the other path instead, which is a smart decision because based on things later, I'm wondering if she would have died if she had gone down the other passage. But instead she follows the other passage. She goes to where she can hear sounds of great revelry. And of course, it's the feast in the Great Hall that she wasn't invited to, even though almost all of the other competitors were invited. So she's kind of pissed off about that. But notably, she doesn't see Cain there either. So note that he is not there at this time. She is not there at this time. Where is he? maybe in the other tunnel. Hmm, question. That is something to be aware of. So then she sees Kaol leave the room and runs back to her chamber. Then Dorian comes there and there, and she then finds her asleep. This I think was kind of like, mm, okay. So Kaol is jealous seeing Dorian in the doorway of Selena's room. And Kaol is fairly certain Selena is a virgin, but did Dorian know it? It probably made him more interested, which I'm like, mm, okay, we don't need to like, be weird about virginity here, but okay. And then he gives Selena a present. I guess there were these party favors, these rings that they were giving out, giving out to the women of the nobility as favors. So he gets one and gives it to Selena. It has a fingernail sized amethyst. Um, and she's like, thank you, and wears it. And this shows up again later. Chapter 25. Selena has this very vivid dream where she smells mildew and roses in this passageway and goes down it, follows the rose scent whenever a door or arch appears until she gets to a set of stairs and an old wooden door with a bronze knocker formed like a skull. And inside the room, she finds a sarcophagus with a beautiful marble statue, trees carved into the ceiling, a second sarcophagus next to this woman depicting a man. Why was the woman's face bathed in moonlight and the man's in darkness? Hmm. The man holds a stone sword between his hands, its handle resting upon his chest and a crown on his head. The woman is also wearing a crown with a slender peak and a blue gem embedded in the center. This is all important. Which queen were you? She sees a mark that looks like a diamond with two arrows piercing its side and a vertical line through its middle, a word mark that she had seen earlier. So everything's starting to tie together. One thing also that's interesting is she looks at the floor of this tomb and it's covered in stars, raised carvings that mirrored the night sky and the ceiling depicted the earth. So she wonders why they're reversed, but also this reminds me of a scene in House of Flame and Shadow, which I just read, where there is also a sort of tomb ish with a map of stars carved into the floor. So I don't know if they're intended to be connected between these two books now that I'm noticing that or if it's just a thing, but I think that's interesting. So then she looks at the walls. There's countless word marks etched onto the surface and something written at the feet of the queen on her coffin. It says, ah, time's rift. She notices that the queen has the pointed arched ears of immortal Fae, and at this moment realizes that this is the tomb of Gavin, the first king of Otterlin, and Elena, the first princess of Terrasen, Brannon's daughter, and Gavin's wife and queen. So this is Gavin and Elena. This is really significant. Why is their tomb so neglected? Why had nobody honored them? Why were there no flowers? Why had was Elena Galathinius Haviliard forgotten? And then she sees a sword prominently displayed before a suit of golden armor, the legendary sword of Gavin named Damaris. So there's a lot going on here. And then Elena's spirit appears to Selena. And this I think is interesting. She's like, are you a ghost? Not quite. I'm alive, but my spirit doesn't haunt this place. I've risked much coming here tonight. She says, I can't stay for long. They were distracted for now. So her spirit has come from wherever it is, not technically a ghost. And she says, who needs distracting? The eight guardians. Guardians are the gargoyles on the clock tower that was built when Dorian was born. 
And the queen says, yes, they guard the portal between our worlds. So where has the queen come from? What's going on? I think what I'm reminded of reading this is the fact that from book one, this world was always a multiverse. There were always portals to other worlds. It's just that we're finally in more recent Sarah J Mass book starting to see that come to fruition in a different way. Elena says, you were meant to come to this castle just as you were meant to be an assassin to learn the skills necessary for survival. Her life has been faded, including becoming an assassin so that she can survive. And again, spoilers for the rest of the series here, but we know that Selena Sardothian is actually Aelin Galathinius. So she is descended from Elena. So her ancestor, the spirit of her ancestor, is coming to talk to her, give her some direction of what, what she needs to do. I'm editing and I want to clarify, I don't think Aelin is actually a direct descendant of Elena, but she is a relation of hers and I guess you could call her an ancestor. So not in the direct line, but they are related. She says, something evil dwells in this castle, something wicked enough to make the stars quake. Its malice echoes into all our worlds. There's portal, there's like time rifts happening here. So questions about that. She says, you must stop it, destroy it before it is too late, before a portal is ripped open so wide there can be no undoing it. You understand the people's plight, you must win the competition and become the king's champion. Aurelia needs you as the king's champion. Uh, then says, they can't catch you here. Wear this. And she pushes something cold and metallic into Selena's hand. It will protect you from harm. You were led here tonight, but not by me. I was led here too. Who? We, we, we don't find out here. Someone wants you to learn. Someone wants you to see who led the two of them there so that they could meet? Who's orchestrating all of this? It's a big question. So she kind of says, courage of the heart is rare. Let it guide you, go. So initially she thinks this is all a dream. She opens her eyes, breathing hard in her room. And she's like, oh, what a weird dream. But then she realizes it wasn't a dream because in her hand is a coin sized gold amulet on a delicate chain. Made of intricate bands of metal, within the round border of the amulet lay two overlapping circles, one on top of the other, and in the space they shared was a small blue gem that gave the center of the amulet the appearance of an eye. A line ran through this entire thing, beautiful and strange. So she ends up wearing this. It's supposed to protect her. It was given for Elena. So she sh shuts that door and now realizes that the tapestry that had hung over it was a tapestry of Elena. Again, we have that phantom breeze smelling of roses and she goes to sleep. So whew, a lot in chapter 25, right? Chapter 26, another champion has been found dead. The body was half eaten. She's like, maybe Cain did it. He's beastly enough to do such a thing. Meanwhile, Kaol is questioning where she was the night before. So maybe he suspects her. She decides to go back and revisit the tomb, kind of trying to figure out what's going on. And she wonders why there's so much light so far beneath the castle and realizes that there's a grate in the ceiling with a gold lined shaft coming down to reflect sunlight or moonlight. She doesn't find anything in the tomb to help her though. So Selena is now kind of wanting to investigate what's up with these murders. She goes to see the thief. His chest cavity was split open, his organs were removed, and his face was stripped of its flesh. His brain was gone. There's smears of blood on the wall that looks like there had been writing that was rubbed away. And she sees three word marks as well in a circle near the body. So it's clearly there's some kind of a ritual death thing happening. One thing that I think is a little sketchy is Grave comes and it says he sticks his gnarled fingers in the pockets of his worn and dirty pants. Didn't his sponsor bother to properly clothe him? And I like I feel like there's something weird about Grave. I don't rem I haven't read this recently enough to remember if there actually is but I feel like that's it makes me wonder if he's not who she thinks he is. I don't know. Meanwhile, Kale's like, any word from your father, Dorian? Where's the king? Where? I wonder where he went off to. Where indeed? Well, if we've read further in the series, we know exactly where he has gone off. And Dorian's like, I haven't the slightest idea. I remember him leaving like this when we were children, but it hasn't happened for some years now. I bet he's doing something particularly nasty. He's not wrong. He's not wrong. Okay, chapter 27. We're back at the clock tower. Selena's like, what is up with the clock tower? What's up with these guardians? Do they move? And again, is like trying to figure out the word marks. Nehemia again is like, you shouldn't try to discover what they say. Nothing good will come of it. 
again, Selena's like, mm, I, I'm not listening. I did. I did not hear anything. She tells Nehemia about what she found with the murder. And Nehemia's like, the blood was smeared, not splattered. And I feel like Nehemia kind of maybe has a sense of what the problem is and what's going on, but she's not going to say anything. Kane shows up. He's like taunting Selena. Her responses are kind of juvenile. And then we find out that Kane knows who she really is. He's like, come on, hit me with all the rage you feel every time you force yourself to miss the bullseye or when you slow yourself down so you don't scale the walls as fast as me. Hit me, Lillian, and let's see what that year in Endovia really taught you. He whispers so she can hear. So he knows that she is actually this assassin. Maybe the Duke told him. We don't know. So Selena, of course, goes to the library because is she gonna listen to Nehemia's warning? No, of course not. She's gonna go research the word marks regardless. And she finds a book talking about them. She learns that there no grammar existed with the word marks. Everything was just symbols that one had to string together. They changed meaning depending on the marks around them. They were painfully difficult to draw. They required precise lengths and angles or they became something else entirely. So we learn a little bit about it. Some books claim the word is the force that holds together and governs Aurelia and not just Aurelia, but countless other worlds too. The word isn't a religion, at least not in the northern parts of the continent, and it's not included in the worship of the goddess or the gods. Very interesting. It says some theories suggest the mother goddess is just a spirit from one of the other worlds, that she strayed through something called a word gate and found Aurelia in need of form and life. And Kale's like, well, that sounds sacrilegious. But I do think this is really interesting that, again, we're getting these indications that there's other worlds, that things are coming through. That I think is significant. She also says, before the goddess arrived, there was life, an ancient civilization, but somehow they disappeared, perhaps through that word gate thing. Ruins exist. Ruins too old to be of fey making. So yeah, some probably did. Again, I think this is where we're seeing possibly a tie-in to the Crescent City series and the direction that that's going. I think that's interesting. She does think Magic had been wiped away from the world on the king's orders. So why had something like the word marks been allowed to remain and have them show up on the murder scene? Yeah, why indeed? What is the king up to? Good question. Uh, we talk, we learn more about the gates. They're both real and invisible things. Humans can't see them. They can be summoned and accessed using the word marks. They open into other realms, some of them good, some of them bad. Again, tying this into Crescent City and what we're seeing with these gates to other realms. There's a lot of similarities here. This is a little random, but she finds a book. It's a large black volume entitled The Walking Dead in tarnished silver letters. Reeks almost like soil and has an illustration of a twisted half decayed face grinning at her flesh falling from its bones. Now this is very like niche, but I almost wonder if this is a reference to one of the compendiums of the Walking Dead graphic novels. Like how interesting would that be if there was this idea? I mean, I don't know if this is what she was doing here, but like they have the like black leather bound ones that have like, a, you know, a zombie face on them. I don't know. And it's got silver lettering. Th that may not at all be the case, but it would be interesting if it was a nod to that in the book. I don't know. It may also just be something else. Something groans in the back of the library and makes a guttural animalistic noise. And she's like, what? Did you hear anything, Hale? And he's like, when do you plan on leaving? So she, she leaves. Chapter 28. It's like the tension is ratcheting up. Honestly, not much happens in ch chapter 28. Yeah, I don't know. It's like, it's like more stuff with like her and Dorian playing billiards. Mm, it's, it's fine. Chapter 29, we have a new test with a sparring par partner. Again, we have Selena being like, shut your mouth, you damned pig, or I'll rip out your tongue. <laughs> Girl, get it together. Come on. She's again missing Sam, wishing that he was there, her uh, supposedly dead best friend. And she's looking at the tapestry of Elena again. In the center is a stag gazing sideways at Elena. This is the symbol of the royal house of Terrison of the kingdom that Bran and Elena's father had founded. A reminder that though Elena had become Queen of Otterland, she still belonged to Terrison. Like Selena, no matter where Elena met, went, no matter how far, Terrison would always be a part of her. Which is kind of funny. Selena, Elena. <laughs> it's like even her her pseudonym um, is 
very similar. We get a scene from Caltaine's perspective, more weirdness. She's got a headache. Her head had been pounding for the last week and today it seemed to throb with the words not enough, not enough, not enough. Even in her sleep the pain seeped in, warping her dreams into nightmares so vivid she couldn't remember where she was when she awoke. So like something is up with Caltaine. This is not just normal petty girl jealousy or like wanting to get ahead. There's something else up here and it's like making it it's making it pretty clear. One thing that's interesting is she tells the queen a lie. She says, His Highness, Prince Dorian, told me only yesterday how much he enjoyed coming here to the court. The lie was easy enough and it somehow made the pain of the headache ease. Interesting. She told the queen that he doesn't come because he's just shy and the queen is like, oh, he's told me that before. She's like, I wish he would find a young woman he favors. It's too bad you're already promised. Her head keeps pounding. She wished for her pipe, but hours remained of the court session. Not enough, not enough, the pain saying. This was her time. She has to get Dorian. So like there, there's something up with that. Lastly, chapter 30. Selena is trying to figure out what's up with the killer. She's wondering how was the killer selecting them? There, were, there was no pattern. Five were dead. They had no connection to each other aside from the competition. She tells Kayal that Kane knows who she really is, her true identity, that Parrington told him and Kane told me. And he seems pretty serious about that and concerned. And then they find yet another body in the servant's passage. Gaping chest cavity, missing brain and face, two word marks drawn on either side of the body in chalk. This time she also sees claw marks in the stone, at least a quarter of an inch. There's no, and this is where things start to get interesting, there's no blood in these claw marks. They're clean, which means whatever did this sharpened its nails before it gutted him, which means it had time to do that before it attacked him. So she notices, she like, you know, does her like some Sherlockian type stuff and realizes Varen would have seen whatever it was long before he got here. Those are clean cuts around his ankles. His tendons were snapped by a knife to keep him from running. His fingernails, the tips are cracked and shattered. Fingernail marks, he was trying to drag himself away by his fingertips. He was alive the entire time. That thing sharpened its claws on the stone while its master watched. And Selena realizes that maybe the champion's killer and Elena's mysterious evil force might be one and the same. How is she just now realizing this? Like that is a piece we could have put together pretty obviously from the get go. But I do think that that's interesting that we now know that there is a creature and a master. And the master is somebody that people must be trusting enough to not be running away from. And then it's incapacitating them so the creature can eat them, basically. Then we get Dorian and Selena having a conversation. He asks her why she likes music. She says she loses herself in it, becomes empty and full all at once. And she says, when I play, for once, I'm not destroying. I'm creating. And she says, I used to want to be a healer back when I was, back before this became my profession, when I was almost too young to remember, I wanted to be a healer. So I think the fact that she wanted to become a healer when she was a little girl is likely part of why she ends up helping another very important character become a healer. So if you know, you know who I'm talking about, but I think that there's a definitely a connection there. She asks Dorian why he's not married yet. And he's like, cause I can't stomach the idea of marrying a woman inferior to me in mind and spirit. It would mean death of my soul. <laughs> and she's like, what? Marriage is a legal contract. It's not a sacred thing. As the crown prince, you should have given up such fanciful notions. What if you're ordered to marry for the sake of alliance? Would you start a war because of your romantic ideals? And he's like, it's not like that. So he's like, he's kind of naive to be honest, but she's like, oh, your father wouldn't command you to marry some princess in order to strengthen his empire. My father has an army to do that for him. You could easily love some woman on the side. Marriage doesn't mean you can't love other people. You marry the person you love and none other. <laughs> and she laughs at him. So I think it's it's interesting. He's like definitely a romantic, a little naive for his place in the world, but okay. She does say, I'm being practical, there's a difference, but you are in a position where it's possible for you to change Aurelia for the better. You could help create a world where true love isn't needed to secure a happy ending. And what sort of world would I need to create for that to happen? A world where men govern themselves. You speak of anarchy and treason. So it's interesting that she's like, people should be able to govern themselves. She's pushing for democracy. 
interesting. Kale is watching Parrington and he notices a shade clouding his eyes that's strange. So there's something up, like we get indications that there's something up with Parrington. Parrington's eyes fell upon the black ring on his left hand and darkened as if his pupils had expanded to encompass all of each eye. Then it was gone. His eyes returned to normal. Is this similar to the black ring that Kane wears on his hand? Hmm, I wonder. I'm enjoying the mystery. I can't believe how much foreshadowing there is and connections to things that she does later on. I think it's really clear going back and rereading this now and I'm glad I'm doing it, but I am gonna read another 10 chapters and then I'll be back to discuss. I am back. I've read the next 10 chapters. So that means through the end of chapter 40 and we've only got 15 chapters left in the book. Before we go back to chapter 31, general thoughts on this section is the mystery is continuing to develop. We have questions about who did it and and Selena ends up with some of her own ideas that honestly are kind of dumb, but that's fine. We'll talk about that when we get there. The love triangle romance is starting to be more evident, and we discover that Nehemia is more than she seems. So yeah, enjoyed. I enjoyed this segment. I will say, and I've been chatting with people in my Discord for the read-along a little bit about this as well, that we've all kind of agreed this book does feel very young and very YA, and it is YA, so I think it makes sense. I do think that the characters grow through the series and it feels less YA a few books in, from what I remember, but it is interesting to go back and read this and be like, oh yeah, these characters read as very young, and I think that makes sense for the audience that this was originally written for. Okay, so let's look at chapter 31. The spirit of Elena comes back to visit her again. Selena's a little bit bratty about it, but she says, I came here to warn you to keep an eye on your right. Look to your right. You'll find the answers there. And Selena's like, what? And then she has a test where you have to identify poisons and rank these goblets of potential poison from least to most deadly and then drink the one that you think is least deadly. They do have antidotes, but she remembers, Elena said, look to your right, you'll find answers there, and copies one of the other contestants and remembers that he had been trained in poisons and she gets it right. Would she have actually died? Probably not because they did have antidotes, but she would have been sick, so I, I guess that helped her. Chapter 32, we're aware that time has passed. October is over, Yulmas is quickly arriving. So we're moving towards the end of the year and the end of all of the competitions. We've got more interactions between Selena and Nehemia and Nehemia says, we're friends, when you need me, I'll be there. And this I think is the thing that Selena is so quick and I guess given her history, it makes sense. But later on, Selena is so quick to distrust Nehemia and to assume bad intentions. It's kind of unfortunate. I do know that it's part of her growth arc of needing to learn how to be a better friend and trust people and stuff given her history, but also justice for Nehemia because like the way that's handled I don't think needed to be. She does say the sound of hooves pounding, thunderous hooves haunts her dreams, and I'm thinking this maybe has something to do with Sam. I remember a bit about what goes on with Sam, but I don't remember everything. So I, I but I, I think that that's where that is coming from. Nehemia is starting to suspect that there's more to Selena or Lillian as she thinks she is than meets the eye because she's like, oh, you should come with me to this, see this acting troupe perform tonight. And she's like, oh, I can't. She's like, yeah, about that. Why are you always locked in your room with guards? We all have our secrets, though I'm curious why you're so closely watched by that captain and locked in your rooms at night. If I were a fool, I'd say they were afraid of you. So I feel like Nehemia sees that there's something up, but she's, you know, still a friend. Nehemia and Selena go to the kennels where they find Dorian with this new batch of pups that had been born and he's not gonna keep them because they're mutts. But there is a, a, a puppy, a fifth pup, a bit larger than the others. Its coat was a silky silvery gold that shimmered in the shadows. And Dorian's like, it has a foul disposition and won't come near anyone, human or canine. And of course, Selena is like, no, don't hurt it. You can't kill it. I am i won't let you harm it. Keep it for me. And so he's like, okay, fine. I promise I will not hurt the dog. And this dog, of course, is going to end up becoming important. Nehemia suspects that there's some chemistry between Selena and Dorian. 
Selena totally denies it, but okay. Then we have a weird interaction with Kane. He was panting, his mouth opening and closing like a fish wrenched from water. His dark eyes were wide and he had a hand around his enormous throat. Is something wrong? She asked. He glanced from side to side before his eyes snapped to hers. His grip on his throat tightened as if to silence the words that fought to come out and the ebony ring on his finger gleamed dully. He seemed to have packed on an additional 10 pounds of muscle in the past few days. In fact, every time she saw him, Kane seemed bigger and bigger. And then he runs really fast down the hallway. So we, we see that there's something weird going on with Kane. He's changing physically. There's strange stuff. She does send messages to her two allies being like, stay in your chambers. Don't open the door for anyone. Chapter 33, we're with Caltane. We find out that what she's been smoking is opium. Surprise, surprise. I'm not shocked that it's some kind of a drug, but Duke Parrington comes to see her. There's this weird moment where it says she found her ears had stopped hearing. His skin seemed to harden and glaze over and his eyes became unforgiving marble orbs. Even the thinning hair was frozen in stone. She gaped as the white mouth continued to move, revealing a throat of carved marble. So really weird, kind of creepy stuff going on with her. Like she is not well, obviously, and she's been smoking opium. She talks about Lillian slash Selena being like, what if Lillian weren't a lady? Her headache flared to life with a sudden burst that sucked the air from her lungs. She suggests that maybe she's disreputable. I heard from someone that her background is not as pure as it should be. What have you heard? Harrington demanded. Their conversation goes on. Something wild and foreign issued a cry within her, shattering through the pain in her head, and thoughts of poppies and cages faded away. She must do what was necessary to save the crown and her future. So I feel like you can really see that she's being not of her own volition pushed to do certain things. She's not in her right mind, and there's drugging stuff going on. What does Duke Parrington have to do with it? This is a question that's still open at this point. Selena finds Nehemia crying and she finds out that Otterland's army had massacred 500 of the Ilwe rebels, including children. And she's distraught, understandably. What is the point in being a princess of Ilwe if I cannot help my people? How can I call myself their princess when such things happen? Selena just says I'm sorry and hugs her while she's crying. Again, they have such a good friendship here and it's horrible that Selena is so quick later on to suspect her. Chapter 34 I love because we have Selena on her period having really bad cramps and that is one thing that I appreciate about Sarah and again is something that we weren't getting a lot of at this time is fantasy books dealing with menstruation because it is a normal part of life and sometimes it's painful. And the fact that we have this chapter where Selena's weight gain after having been nearly starved in the mines had finally brought her cycles back. She's dealing with really severe nausea and cramping. I just think that having that kind of representation in a fantasy book is great and more people should do that. Uh, Joe Abercrombie also has periods, which I think is great. Of course, Kayal comes in and thinks she's sick about what happened to Nehemia's people. And it is it is interesting how Kayal being captain of the guard and Dorian being the prince are both very sympathetic to the rebels, which is not necessarily what you would expect. Kayal says, I'd like to think that if my country was conquered, I would stop at nothing to win back my people's freedom too. And so he doesn't think she's really sick, but then she vomits all over him. And then he's like, oh, you really are sick. What's wrong? And then she's like, my monthly cycles finally came back. And he's like, oh, I, if then, I'll take my leave. <laughs> like he's like very typical. It's kind of hilarious. But then of course, Dorian comes in and is like, I intercepted Kale and he informed me of your condition. You'd think a man in his position wouldn't be so squeamish, especially after examining all of these corpses. So he kind of distracts her. This scene I think is really entertaining. She's like, out, 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 leave me be and go womanize someone else. <laughs> it's just, it's great. So I love the fact that Dorian's like, yeah, periods, whatever. And Kale's like, oh my God. I don't know. It's good. Then he finds out that she has bought and been reading a book called Sunset's Passions, which is a steamy romance novel. And he's like, oh, do you actually read this rubbish? And she's like, you may borrow it when I'm done. If you read it, your literary experience will be complete and it'll give you some creative ideas of things to do with your lady friends. He hissed, I will not read this. 
then I suppose you're just like hail. The banter to me is funny and also now seeing how Sarah has kind of pivoted to wanting to write more romance you can really see how she was a fan of romance books from the get-go. The fact that we have this moment of this steamy romance showing up in Throne of Glass. I didn't remember that but I just I find it interesting. We've got you know lots of angst and yearning. Dorian wanting to know what Selena's lips feel like and things like that. Selena being upset she can't attend the Yulmus Ball but of course w working on her own plots to try to attend anyway. We have Kaol overlooking Selena and Dorian being like she's deceitful, cunning, vicious but I can't make my feet move. He feels his barriers melting. He let them melt. So he's he's falling for her too and he has a lot of compassion for her. He realizes she at 17 had gone to a death camp and survived. What terrified him even more was that he trusted her and he didn't know what that meant about himself. So we're seeing Kaol softening. She hasn't seen Nehemia for a while. Three more competitors have died. There are only six people left including Kane and Grave and Knox. And then we have an interesting conversation between Dorian and Selena that gives us some information about the amulet that she got from Elena. He's like where did you get that? And she's like oh you know I just found it in a jewelry box whatever. And so he keeps looking at it and he's like you know Gavin was my hero when I was a kid and Elena, first queen of Otterland, had a magical amulet. In the battle with the Dark Lord, Gavin and Elena found themselves defenseless against him. He was about to kill the princess when a spirit appeared and gave her the necklace. And when she put it on, Erewhon couldn't harm her. She saw the Dark Lord for what he was and called him by his true name. It surprised him so much that he became distracted and Gavin slew him. They called her necklace the Eye of Elena it's been lost for centuries. So of course she kind of pushes it off and he's like, oh, you know, your necklace looks just like it. Maybe it's a replica. She's like, oh, maybe. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure the original is like dust now, but apparently a spirit, the spirit of Elena has now come to give her the eye of Elena. It is interesting because it says she saw the Dark Lord for what he was and called him by his true name. So there's some kind of a, a glamour and being able to see him for what he really is that I think is going to end up maybe being important. Selena is starting to wonder what Elena is trying to do. She's thinking Elena would have had to know someone would recognize her amulet. If it was the real thing, the king could kill her on the spot for wearing not only an heirloom of his house, but something of power. But of course the king is not back there yet. Then Selena finds a bunch of word marks under her bed written in chalk. She washes them off but that's super creepy so is she about to be targeted? And then when she can't sleep she goes to the library and sees Nehemia reading a book and this is an interesting moment and this is where Selena instead of trusting her friend starts to suspect her even though honestly I think it's kind of a stupid suspicion. She's shifted her eyes to the princess's book. That wasn't the book they used during their lessons. No, it was a thick aging book crammed with dense lines of text. What are you reading? She slams the book shut is like nothing. I thought you couldn't read at that level yet. Then you're like every ignorant fool in this castle Lillian, she said with perfect pronunciation in the common tongue. Not giving her a chance to reply, the princess strode away. It didn't make sense. Nehemia couldn't read books that advanced, not when she still some stumbled through lines of text. And Nehemia never spoke with that kind of flawless accent. And then she sees a piece of paper that had fallen out and on it is a word mark. So instead of thinking, hmm, maybe Nehemia is purposefully making herself seem less smart than she is in order to protect herself in her enemy's castle, she suspects that like oh maybe she's warning me to stay away from the word marks not to help me but because she's the person who's been using them to kill all these people. Which why would she do that? What's the point of her killing all of the champions if she was trying to kill people in the ca in the castle as the person she is she would target other people. It just doesn't make sense but this is what she starts to suspect. Chapter 36 Selena of course then is like uh okay well I'm doubling down on researching the word marks after that and it is Yulmus and she gets a huge bag of candy on her pillow and eats like half of it and ends up with stained red teeth. It's kind of silly. It just it's it's young like it, it it's young but I think 
that was what I found so delightful about it when I first read it. It turns out Dorian had given her the candy and then also brings her that golden haired puppy and is like, you need to name her. And of course, Selena names her Fleetfoot. And Fleetfoot is going to be a significant part of her life for quite a while. One thing that I think gives us an indication of why she doesn't trust Nehemia is it says she'd seen friends do terrible things before and it had become safer for her to believe the worst. She'd witnessed firsthand how far a need for revenge could drive someone. Perhaps Nehemia wouldn't do anything, perhaps she was just being paranoid and ridiculous, but if something happened tonight, she's worried about Kaol and Dorian getting hurt at the ball, and so she decides to find a way to get herself to the Yulmus ball. I feel like maybe Sam is the friend who had done terrible things before in a need for revenge. I don't know. I mean, I think that's right, but chapter 37 she goes to the temple services it sounds kind of cool it's uh built entirely from glass where there's like snow up on top i don't know it sounds kind of like a cool space one thing that's interesting and i think is a tie to other books in this universe is we see the high priestess and here's the description of her the folds of her midnight blue gossamer robe fell around her and her white hair was long and unbound an eight-pointed star was tattooed upon her brow in a shade of blue that matched her gown, its sharp lines extending to her hairline. Okay, so where else do we see an eight-pointed star? We see it in the Akatar series, we see it in the Crescent City series. This eight-pointed star I think is connecting all of them and is very important. I did not realize it first shows up in the first Throne of Glass book. Tattooed on this priestess's forehead. That is interesting. She says that this is the day that the great goddess gave birth to her firstborn, Lumus, lord of the gods. With his birth, love was brought into Aurelia and it banished the chaos that arose from the gates of the word. And then of course she and Kaol both fall asleep in church. <laughs> which is kind of funny. The last thing though is the procession of the gods where, where every year nine children were chosen and blindfolded to represent each god. If the child stopped before you, you received the blessings of the god and the small gift the child carried as a symbol of the god's favor. Duke Parrington gets the miniature silver sword from the god of war, unsurprising. And then the child dressed as Diana, goddess of the hunt and maidens, approaches Selena and says, May Diana, the huntress and protector of the young, bless and keep you this year. I bestow upon you this golden arrow as a symbol of her power and good graces. So that is interesting that the huntress and protector of the young is blessing her and she gets this solid gold arrow. Chapter 38. Selena is getting dressed up to go to the masquerade Yulmus ball and we have the description of this dress that she wears. I love the dresses in this. I love the descriptions. Isn't pure white but a grayish offset of white. Skirts and bodice encrusted with thousands of minuscule crystals with swirls of thread on the bodice in rose-like designs and a border of ermine lining the neck. So it basically looks like stars on her skirt, which I think is kind of cool. I know not everybody likes the clothing description but I do enjoy them. So she does in fact make it to the ball. Dorian and Kale are kind of jealous of each other because first Dorian thinks she's paying attention to Kale and then Dorian asks her to dance and she dances with him a whole bunch that night and Kale is kind of jealous a little bit but trying to let it go. So you know things are heating up with the love triangle but she is there to watch out for Nehemia who is mostly just sitting next to the Queen of Otterland wearing a gold and turquoise mask with a lotus motif. When she finally speaks with Nehemia she says you look beautiful Lillian in the common tongue her accent as thick as it had ever been. It felt like a slap in the face. She'd spoken with perfect fluency that night in the library. Was she warning Selena to keep quiet about it? As do you. Are you enjoying the ball? She's like, yes, but I'm not feeling well. I'm going back to my, my rooms. So she just goes ahead and leaves. I think it is really unfortunate that this was her reaction. I think she should have trusted her friend a little bit more and been smart enough to realize that there are probably a lot of good reasons that she's pretending to have a thick accent when she doesn't have to because of the assumptions people make about her and the fact that she showed some of her true self to Selena is a big deal. So I just, ugh, 
I, just, I, I think it's really unfortunate. You know, more angst and longing with the dancing. We have Dorian's perspective where he's like, lost in a world of which he'd always dreamed. Her body was warm beneath his hand. Her fingers were soft around his. He spun her and led her around the floor, waltzing as smoothly as he could. He wants to kiss her. Kale's watching them dance. Another guardsman is like, oh, it looks like Dorian's in love with her. Kale is like, oh, shoot, Dorian's expression was full of something joy, wonder. His shoulders were straight, his back erect. He looked like a man, like a king. It was impossible for such a thing to have occurred, and when would it have ha happened? But she wasn't in love with him. He'd seen no attachment on her part, and Selena would never be that stupid. It was Dorian who was the fool. Dorian who would have his heart broken if he did actually love her. Unable to look at his friend any longer, the captain of the guard left the ball. Yeah. -oh. Meanwhile, Caltain is pissed about the fact that Dorian and uh, Selena are dancing, dancing, dancing at the ball. She is like, what sort of person wears gray to a ball? My gown and mashing peacock mask cost as much as a small house. A gift from Parrington. <laughs> it's like kind of a lot. After the ball, Dorian follows her and kisses her for the first time. So got some kissing going on and she's like, what am I doing? He's the crown parents of Otterlin. He's my enemy. I need to go to bed. But then she goes to the balcony and flings open the doors, embracing the chill air. Her hand rose to her lips and she stared up at the stars, feeling her heart grow and grow and grow. When I read that line, I like, couldn't help thinking of like the Grinch who stole Christmas. His heart grew three sizes that day. I don't know. I don't know. Meanwhile, of course, though, Kaol is in the garden below looking up at her on the balcony, longing angstily as well. So we've got lots of angst in this little love triangle. Lastly, chapter 40. Okay, this is when she officially names Fleetfoot and they have, you know, interaction about the kissing. There's a line that I like where she's about to get changed and Dorian sees her back with these kind of nasty scars and he's like, oh, your scars are awful. And she says, we all bear scars, Dorian. Mine just happen to be more visible than most. I think that's a good line. It's a very, very solid line. We've got Caltain with Duke Parrington in this weird greenhouse. There's something weird going on with him, going on with his ring, of course, but he decides to tell Caltain the truth about who Selena really is and that she is an assassin. And of course, Caltain is like, what? How can we stop them? Tell the king? And Parrington's like, no, she's to face the remaining champions in a duel. And in the duel, she'll drink a toast in honor of the goddess and gods. I was going to ask you to preside over the toast as a representation of the goddess. Perhaps you could slip something into her drink. Give her a dose of blood bane, which is the most dangerous poison that they tested in that, that test that they had. Not lethal, but just enough to cause her to lose control. It would give Cain the advantage he needs. And so she basically agrees, partly because he's probably using his power on him. Things are coming to a head. We've got the final duel coming up where Selena is probably going to face Cain. We've got a plot to drug her beforehand. We've got these murders to figure out. We've got the thing with Nehemia where Selena is not trusting her. We've got a love triangle. There's a lot happening here and we have 15 chapters left in the book. So I think what I'm going to do is read the next seven chapters, check in, and then read the end of the book and do my final check-in. All right, I have read the next seven chapters. This is the penultimate clip in this very long video that I then will have to go edit. So <laughs> that's gonna be exciting. I feel like this was the great place to end because it's right before the major ending of the book or like the major events of the end of the book. So let's take a look. Chapter 41. She's still suspecting Nehemia. Like, girl, come on, why? She's like, how long did it take Nehemia to learn the weird marks? And how could their power possibly still work when magic itself was gone from the world? All good questions, but why are we still suspecting Nehemia? Nehemia had been deceitful about her language skills and how much she knew about the word marks, but she could have any number of reasons for that. Yes, yes, go with that thought, Selena. Go with that thought. She could have had lots of other reasons than being this killer. Nehemia was one of the good ones. She wouldn't target Selena, not when they'd been friends. They had been friends. She still doesn't trust her, which I think is really unfortunate. Then she finds the symbols that she'd seen near the bodies and in the margin written by someone centuries ago was the explanation. 
for sacrifices to the Ritterak. Using the victim's blood, mark the area around it accordingly. Once the creature has been summoned, these marks guide the exchange. For the flesh of the sacrifice, the beast will grant you the victim's strength. Okay, now let me just say, if Selena was being smart here, this is the point at which she would say, oh my god, it must be Cain. That's why he's getting so big and muscly in a weirdly unusual way. He's probably the murderer, like, obviously. But is that what she thinks? No, no. She's so stuck on this Nehemia thing. She's like, ooh, I wonder why Nehemia needs all the strength of the champions. <laughs> no, <laughs> come on, it's so dumb. It's so dumb. She's like, Nehemia could easily be a cunning actress. Why does she need their strength? Maybe she's trying to start a rebellion. But why kill the champions? Why not target royals? The ball would have been perfect for that. I'm like, yes, yes, good questions. This is because your theory makes no sense. Your theory makes no sense, Elena. You're being an idiot. And then she's like, oh, wait, the tunnels beneath the castle. It must be Nehemia. I'm like, why does the tunnels beneath the castle being a good place to summon these creatures mean that it must be Nehemia? This does not make any sense. It's so stupid. There are way better suspects. And she's like, if Nehemia had truly lied to her like that, and if Nehemia was murdering the champions, then Selena had to see it to herself, if only so she could kill her with her bare hands. The other thing about this is, Selena, you are literally in the palace of your enemy. Why do you even care if she is killing them to start a rebellion? makes zero sense. This makes zero sense. I feel like I, I, okay, to be fair, I think what probably happened here is Sarah was writing her debut novel and wanted to give us a red herring for the mystery. And so she gave us a red herring that makes Selena look like an idiot. So, you know, is this a new to writing problem? Very likely, but it's frustrating. <laughs> so of course, Selena's like, I am going down into those tunnels to figure out what's going on so I can see for myself if Nehemia is the one doing this. But of course, when she gets there, there's somebody chanting, and it's not Nehemia, it's a man. He panted as he spoke, like the words burned his throat and finally gasped for air. And look, and there, kneeling before a darkness so black it seemed poised to devour the world, was Cain, obviously. Obviously it was Cain. <laughs> no one in their right mind would think it was Nehemia at this point. Oh my god. Okay, chapter 42. Cain, the person who'd gotten stronger and better as the competition went on? <laughs> She'd thought it was his training, but it was because he'd been using the word marks on the beast they summoned to steal the dead champion's strength. <laughs> like, girl, this, it's so, it's so absurd that you could not figure out what was actually going on here. Okay. He calls forth this creature with like an animal's hind legs. It's the Ritterak. Cain raised his head and stood slowly as the creature knelt before him and lowered its dark eyes. Submission. He sees her and says, it wasn't meant to be you tonight, but this opportunity is too good to waste. So he shuts her into the room with this creature and leaves. It doesn't attack her immediately though. It sniffs at her and swipes at the ground with a clawed hand, striking deep enough to take out a chunk of stone. It wanted her alive. So I think it's likely that maybe she doesn't smell like prey because of the thing she's wearing, but she just assumes. So she throws down her cape and tricks it into breaking the door open for her. And she runs to the tomb where there's the sword that Elena had led her to before, Damaris, the sword of the ancient king. And she uses it to run the creature through and kill it. But it gets her hand in its mouth and bites her. One thing that is a little weird is she says that it was surprisingly light as if its bones were hollow or there were nothing inside of it, which my question is, if it's that light, how did it break the door down when it ran at it? Make it make sense. Maybe it's a magical thing, but I don't know. So she passes out. Nehemia comes and finds her, probably because Fleetfoot, I suspect, went to get her. And Nehemia 
heals her using word marks. The princess held her firm, saying words in a tongue the assassin didn't understand. The light in the room pulsed and her skin tingled. Selena found her arms covered in glowing turquoise marks, word marks. Nehemia held her in the water, rocking back and forth. Blackness swallowed her up. Okay, so Nehemia can use word marks, but she's not the enemy. She healed her. Oh, Selena, like, oh, come on, get it together. Okay, chapter 43. <laughs> She wakes up, her hand is completely healed. There are some small scars, but that's it. And she's like, what? And it's only been three hours. Nehemia's like, I want to know where you received that bite, what happened. And Selena reveals who she really is and that she was from Endovir. And they kind of have like a, an evening talking, but Selena still doesn't tell her about Cain or the the beast. There is this moment where Nehemia names her as, you bear many names and so I shall name you as well. Her hand rose to Selena's forehead and she drew an invisible mark. I name you Elantia. She kissed the assassin's brow. I give you this name to use with honor, to use when other names grow too heavy. I name you Elantia, spirit that could not be broken. Like this is really sweet. Nehemia is a great friend. Selena is a shitty one. I <laughs> I, I, it still makes me angry that Nehemia is going to end up dying. I'm like, do we have to do this? So then Selena does something else really stupid. Because of course we're, we're not done. Does she go tell anybody about Cain and the creature that he unleashed? No, of course she doesn't. She's like, well, I killed it. So we're probably good. This is absurd. You think that's the only one? You think you can't call more of them with that magic? That there was just one of them, you killed it and it's over? Really? Really? <laughs> okay. But she doesn't want to tell anyone because she doesn't want them to know she has an un unguarded escape route. So she's like, it's fine. It's over. I'll just defeat him in the duel. We'll be all good. Seems like a bad choice. Then the King of Otterland shows up. Chapter 44. King is super creepy. And, uh... I don't know. It's really sketchy because he's come back and everyone in his traveling party somehow died in the White Fang Ma Mountains. Supposedly because rebels poison their food stores. Makes no sense. Super sketchy. The king survived. Everybody else is dead. What the hell? Chapter 45. They're training before their final sort of tests. Cain weirdly doesn't seem surprised to see her still. Why do I have hiccups right now? Oh my god. Cain weirdly doesn't seem surprised to see her alive. And she finally thinks about the black ring on his finger and is like, does it have a connection? Maybe. And she's wondering how he learned how to summon this creature. What else is going on? Nox starts questioning things. Where'd you get those scars? You're not really a jewel thief, are you? And she's like, listen, she reveals who she really is and is like, listen, you need to get out of here. If I had any other option, I would be taking off. He hears her. And if you're thinking that later on it's going to be important that she let Knox go and befriended him, you are right. Not in this book, but in a later one. Caltaine, on her opium, walks by Kane and has a weird experience where it looks like shadows are leaking out of him. And when she gets close to him, the whisper of wings fills the air. She sees things swooping past him and hovering above him. Super weird and creepy. More stuff with Selena and Dorian and like, you know, the aftermath of their kiss. She assumes that Cain must have learned about word marks in the White Fang Mountains, where they say old women with iron teeth still wander. <sighs> Those old women with teeth are the witches that we're going to learn more about later. She has a nightmare with thundering hooves and being chased by a demon. And it, yeah, just kind of drags it out. Basically, chapter 47, Caltain puts the vial of poison in the goblet intended for Selena. Cain is wearing the garb of the guards. Seems like the king already thinks he's probably going to be the winner. Nehemia gives Selena her staff for her fights, which is cool. She says, let it be with an Ilway weapon that you take them down. Let wood from the forest of Ilway defeat steel from Otterlin. Let the king's champion be someone who understands how innocents suffer. And Selena realizes that the princess is also asking her as the king's champion to find ways to save lives and undermine the king's authority, and she accepts. Cain wins his first fight. Her fight with Grave is about to begin in chapter 48, and then if she wins, she'll fight Cain. So that's where we're at. 
let's finish the book and see where we are. All right, it is the next day. I have finished reading Throne of Glass and I'm ready to talk about the final eight chapters of the book. A lot of action happens. We're going to get into the nitty gritty of it and then I will give you my overall thoughts on this reading experience. Chapter 48, she does her fight with Grave. She whispers to him her true identity, Selena Sardothian, and she easily beats him in like two minutes. B but then of course Caltaine offers her the wine that is laced with a poison. Drink and let her bless you and replenish your strength and uh, everything kind of goes off. The world starts getting foggy, she has blurry vision, her stomach starts hurting, and things do not go well. Everything starts slowing down, Cain is injuring her, and she realizes that it hadn't been wine in the glass, it was bloodbane, the very drug that she just barely figured out in the test and had had to cheat with, and so we've got a problem. Kaol is freaking out as he's watching this, and then there's an interesting moment where Kane is looking at her and somehow is able to see who she really is. He says, it's all there, right under that wall you built on top of it. I can see it, clear as day. What was it like when you woke up between your parents, covered in their blood? Your mother was a pretty young thing, wasn't she? So somehow he is now able to see her past. And I think part of it is that other beings are maybe inhabiting him at this point. And Selena with the drug, as we find out later, interacting with the magic in her blood is allowing her to see into a different realm. And that's part of what's going on. She gets pushed into the wall of the Black Tower because that's where they're fighting. And she sees something that looks undead staring back at her from inside. At first she thinks that she's hallucinating, but then later it happens again. Cain grabbed her and shoved her against the clock tower once more, her face smashing into the stone. When she opened her eyes, the world shifted. Blackness was everywhere. Deep down she knew it wasn't just a hallucination she saw. Who she saw truly existed just beyond the veil of her world. The poisonous drug had somehow opened her mind to see them. There were two creatures now, and the second one had wings. The dead, demons, monsters, they wanted her. They were going to bring her inside their realm, and the tower was the gaping portal. She would be devoured. Cain grabs her amulet and tears it off of her neck, and then suddenly the bloodbane fully seizes control of her mind. She sees an army of the dead. He drops the amulet on the ground, and we have chapter 49. Dorian is horrified. And it says, he watched in wide-eyed terror as Selena thrashed on the ground, waving away things they couldn't see. What was happening? Had there been something in that wine? But there was also something abnormal about the way Kane just stood there smiling. Was there actually something there they couldn't see? So he's starting to suspect that something really is going on, even though it looks like Selena's just laying on the ground and thrashing. It also becomes really clear that she's been drugged at this point. Meanwhile, Nehemia comes to the edge of the fighting circle and starts saying something under her breath, moving her fingers, rapidly tracing symbols. So she's trying to take the poison out of Selena. Darkness rippled around Kane like shreds of clothing in the wind. She's certain she is going to die soon. Doors burst open, doors of wood, doors of iron, doors of air and magic. From another world, Elena swept down, cloaked in golden light. The ancient queen's hair glittered like a shooting star as she plummeted into Aurelia. She exploded through the lit ranks of the dead, scattering them. Cain's sword came down, and a gust of wind slammed into Cain so hard he was sent sprawling to the ground, his sword flying across the veranda. The king is giving Cain the go-ahead to kill Elena, even though at the start of this he said, no killing in these fights, but he, he wants her dead. The demons surge again, but Queen Elena is challenging them. It says, through fading eyes, Selena saw a crown of stars glittering atop Elena's head, her silver armor shining like a beacon in the blackness. She stretched out a hand and golden light burst from her palm, forming a wall between them and the dead as she rushed to Selena's side and cupped her face in her hands. I cannot protect you, she whispered. Her face was different too, sharper, more beautiful, her fey heritage. I cannot give you my strength, but I can remove this poison poison from your body. She says, once the poison is gone, you will not see me. You will not see the demons. And so Elena is like putting marks on Selena's brow. And I think this is because Nehemia at the same time is trying to make this happen with her magic. Cain walks up and it says, Cain bearing the shadow, dark thing that dwelled inside of him. So something's already like living within him, stepped through the wall as if it were nothing, shattering it completely. 
Petty tricks, your majesty, Cain said to Elena, just petty tricks. You were brought here, all of you, all the players in the unfinished game. My friends, he gestured to the dead, have told me so. So we still don't know who's pulling all the strings here, who brought Elena and Selena to each other. Elena charges the dead and is fighting them. She says the poison is almost gone. And then Selena realizes that Nehemia is doing something, moving her hands strangely and helping make this happen. The poison leaves Selena's body. Kane, once again a man of flesh and blood, walks over to the sprawled assassin and she stands up even with her messed up leg and injuries and stuff at this point, right? Chapter 50, a mark burned on her forehead in blinding blue light. What's that on your face? Cain asked. The king rose, his brows narrowed and nearby. Nehemia gasped. So there's some kind of a blue light, a mark on her forehead that is significant. And we remember Nehemia was looking at her forehead earlier and seeing something that Selena couldn't see. I think there's something visible that is showing her heritage here and who she really is. Selena buries the jagged end of Nehemia's staff into Cain's side. She is called the victor. The king is clearly not happy about it. And then Nehemia collapses because she's kind of used up all of her energy trying to take the poison out of Selena's body. So Cain is not dead here, but he's seriously injured. Selena starts laughing and Dorian is like, she needs a healer. And then while he's putting his arms around Selena, he misses a look exchange between Cain and his father. The soldier pulled out his dagger. So the king wants her dead, like I said, but Kaol saw. Cain raised his dagger to strike the girl in the back and without thinking, without understanding, Kaol leapt between them and plunged his sword through Cain's heart. Okay, so Kaol ends up killing Cain when he's gonna stab Selena in the back after she'd already been declared the champion. At this point is in love with her. He loved her, no empire, no king, no earthly fear would keep him from her, no. If they tried to take her from him, he'd rip the world apart with his bare hands. And for some reason, that didn't terrify him. So lots of melodrama here. And then Caltaine is the one who sort of takes the fall for the poison. So she's like, I thought you said this damn drug would work. And the Duke is like, what's in your hand? You know what it is. The damn poison I gave her that you gave me. And Poison's like, what? I wouldn't do that. Why would you poison her? And she's going to be imprisoned for that. Chapter 51, we've got the king talking to Dorian. He's still kind of pissed. If she'd been really good, she would have noticed the poison before she drank. Dorian says, I don't have an attachment to her. He also says that they shouldn't be using Nehemia as a hostage, that it might cause more of a rebellion. And the king is like, yeah, okay, I'll tell Parrington to stop that planning. Selena's not sleeping well. She's having nightmares. She wonders what became of Elena's amulet because it was pulled from her. She has a feeling that the nightmares are due to its absence and wished for it to be restored to her, even though Cain is now dead. Nehemia comes to talk to her now that she's recovered and tells her, yes, I did in fact save your life. As you saw, my gifts enable me to see what others normally cannot. Yesterday, the bloodbane Caltaine put in your wine made you see it too. What lurks beyond the veil of this world. I don't think Caltaine intended that effect but it reacted to your blood in that way. Magic calls to magic. So again, we're being told that there is magic in Selena's blood. There's something about her that's significant and there, there's more, just, just wait. And Nehemia's like, I wanted a friend. I liked you. That's why I pretended I needed lessons. She also admits that she was doing research on the word marks. She did know all about them. She said, I know how to read them and how to use them. My entire family does, but we keep it a secret, passed down from generation to generation. They are only to be used as a last defense against evil or in the gravest of illnesses. Well, even though the word marks are a different kind of power, I'm sure if people discovered I was using them, I'd be imprisoned for it. We keep them a secret because of the terrible power they wield. Most have used their power for wicked deeds. She said from the moment she arrived here, she was aware someone was using the word marks to call forth demons from the other worlds. That fool Cain knew enough about the word marks to summon the creatures, but didn't know how to control them and send them back, because of course he didn't. I've spent months banishing and destroying the creatures he summoned. That is why I've sometimes been so absent. So she's got good reasons for everything. Uh, also, we find out that the marks under Selena's bed that she kept washing away were protective marks that were put there by Nehemia. And she was like, they're for your protection. You have no idea what a nuisance it was to have to keep redrawing them every time you washed them away. 
so she might have died sooner if not for that. So Nehemia has saved her multiple times and is doing all of this stuff to protect her. Honestly, I think we could probably say that unfortunately she maybe falls into this magical Negro trope where she does magical things for the purpose of saving the life of the white main character and furthering her plot line instead of having her own entirely separately. I mean she has somewhat of her own plot but it gets sidelined as we'll see later on in the series and I really think that's unfortunate because I think she's a fantastic character and deserved better. We learn a little bit more about the portals and the other worlds or other realms and Nehemia says that she opened a portal into one of the realms of the other world to let through Elena, the first queen of Ot Otterlin. Selena says, you know her? No, but she answered my call for help. Not all realms are full of darkness and death. Some are filled with creatures of good, beings that if our need is great enough, will follow us into Aurelia to help in our task. She heard your plea for help long before I opened the portal. Selena is asking if it's possible to go to those other worlds. Nehemia is like, I don't know. My schooling isn't completed. But the queen was both in and not in this world. She was in the in-between, where she could not fully cross over, nor could the creatures that you saw. It takes an enormous amount of power to open a true portal to let something through. And even then, the portal will close after a moment. That I think is interesting that the creatures and Elena were both not fully coming from one world to another. They're living in this in-between, whatever that is. So it's not a full portal being opened. This is also important because eventually we are going to get full portals being opened. So keep that in mind. Selena's like, in that place, Cain didn't look like Cain. He looked like a demon. Why? And Nehemia says, perhaps the evil he kept summoning seeped into his soul and twisted him into something he was not. Nehemia also says, do you know what the word mark is that's burned on your forehead? <laughs> Selena's like, no, do you? No, I do not. And I've seen it there before. It seems to be a part of you. And I do worry what the king thinks of it. It's a miracle he hasn't questioned it farther. They, so Nehemia promises there will be no more secrets between them, etc. Chapter 52. This is kind of the aftermath. We've got Dorian talking to Selena as she's recovering. Dorian says, I should have sliced Cain open the moment he laid a hand on you. Instead, I stood there as Kaol knelt at the sidelines. I should have been the one to kill Cain. He kisses her, but it makes her jaw hurt because she's injured. So of course, he also says, I knew you'd win the moment I met you. Okay. Then we have the King of Otterlin having a conversation with Duke Parrington. He's stroking Nothung's pommel, which is his sword, and Parrington is kneeling before him. The king has decided he's not going to punish Kale, if only to avoid Dorian raising hell in the captain's defense. If only Dorian had been born a soldier, not a reader. But perhaps a few months at the battlefront would do him some good and hone him into a general if he was pushed. As for the assassin, once she was healed, what better person to have at his bidding? Besides, there were no others in whom he could place his trust. Selena Sardothian was his best and only choice now that Cain was dead. The king was well versed in word marks, but he'd never seen one like hers. He would find out. And if it were an indication of some fell deed or prophecy, he'd have the girl hanging by nightfall. Someone had interfered and saved her. And if those creatures both protected and attacked her, perhaps she was not a person to die at his command, not before he discovered the meaning of her mark. For now, though, he had more important things to worry about. So he is aware there's something with her mark. He doesn't know what it means, but he wants to find out. Then he's talking to Parrington. He says, your manipulation of Caltaine was interesting. Were you using the power on her? No, I've relaxed it recently, as you've suggested, the Duke replied, rotating the obsidian ring around his thick finger. Besides, she was starting to look noticeably affected drained and pale, and she even mentioned the headaches. The king says it was clever of you to experiment on her. She's become a strong ally and still suspects nothing of our influence. I have high hopes for this power. Cain proved the physical transformative effects, and Caltain proves the ability to influence thoughts and emotions. I would like to test its full ability to hone the minds of a few others. Harrington is still into Caltain and wants her for himself. He says, don't fear, she won't remain in the dungeons forever. When the scandal has been forgotten and the assassin is busy with my work, we'll make Caltain an offer she can't refuse. But there are ways of controlling her if you think she can't be trusted. And then he's like, oh, and stop pushing your plan to use the Eelway princess. It's attracting too much attention. So there's plots within plots going on here. This, I think, is going to be significant for Crown of Midnight as we go into the next book. 
chapter 53 you know selena is recovering with fleetfoot she's having she's having dreams filled with archaic words and long forgotten faces with word marks that glowed blue the king and a dead army summoned from the realms of hell which interesting now that we know that hell with a single l is a place in the crescent city series she meets up with kaol and says thank you for killing kane i still remember how it felt when i made my first kill it wasn't easy he says that's why i can't stop thinking about it because it was easy i just took my sword and killed him i wanted to kill him he knew about your parents how so this is where we're going to find out about kind of the how awful it was what she went through she says it was long ago it had been raining and i thought the dampness on their bed as i climbed in was from the open window and i woke the next morning and realized it wasn't rain oh that's so horrifying that's like really i mean re really traumatizing like she's been through so much but then she says it was very long ago i don't even remember what they looked like that was another lie she remembered every detail of her parents faces she and kale hug dorian walks in on them things are kind of awkward. Again, we have this whole love triangle thing happening. She finds out she's going to officially be named the king's champion the next day and sign her contract with the king. And then she breaks things off with Dorian, even though they've been like making out and stuff like that. She says, I have enough secrets. I don't need another one. And if this relationship became something more, then it would only complicate matters when she eventually left the castle. Not to mention the complications of being with Dorian while she served as his father's champion. Though she wanted him, though she cared for him, she knew a lasting relationship wouldn't end well, not when he was heir to the throne. He's like, are you saying you don't want to be with me? I'm saying that I'm going to leave in four years and I don't know how this could possibly end well for either of us. I'm saying I don't want to think about the options. I'm saying that in four years I'm going to be free and I've never been free in my entire life and I want to know what that feels like. He says, as you wish, but I'd like to remain your friend always. So they're friends, no longer anything else, at least for the time being. Chapter 54, she tells Kaol that she ended things. She says, I'm the king's champion. Surely you realize how inappropriate it would be for me to have a relationship with a prince. And he says, I was wondering when you'd come to your senses. So, you know, there's still something between the two of them, of course. Selena stood in the tomb and knew she was dreaming. She often visited the tomb in her dreams to slay the Ritterach again, to be trapped inside Elena's sarcophagus, to face a featureless young woman with golden hair and a crown far too heavy for her to bear. Maybe herself? Maybe? Maybe? But tonight, it was just her and Elena, and the tomb was filled with moonlight. The queen asks how she's recovering, and it says the queen's armor was gone, replaced by her usual flowing gown. I didn't know you were a warrior, she said, jerking her chin toward the sand stand where Damaris stood. There are many things history has forgotten about me. Elena's blue eyes glowed with sorrow and anger. I fought on the battlefields during the demon wars against Erewhon, at Gavin's side. That's how we fell in love. But your legends portray me as a damsel who waited in a tower with a magic necklace that would help the heroic prince. Elena says, you could be different. You could be great. Greater than me. Than any of us. You could rattle the stars. Uh, iconic phrase in the series, rattle the stars. This is something that's going to come back. You know, I've got to, I've got to give it to Sarah. She, she does like a good series tagline. We've got light it up and through love all is possible. <laughs> in the Crescent City series. Rattle the Stars is definitely one that we see repeated in Throne of Glass. But Elena says you could do anything if you only dared and deep down you know it too. That's what scares you the most. There are people who need you to save them as much as you yourself need to be saved. I was sleeping a long endless sleep and I was awoken by a voice and that voice didn't belong to one person but many. Some whispering, some screaming, some not even aware that they were crying out but they all want the same thing. Her mark burns and then fades, and when you are ready, when you start to hear them crying out as well, then you will know why I came to you, and why I have stood by you, and will continue to watch over you no matter how many times you shove me away. She says, blood ties can't be broken. Blood ties can't be broken, because there is a blood tie between Elena and Selena. So, yeah. Chapter 55, this is the final chapter in the book, and this is her going before the king to finally sign her contract. He says, there will be no questioning on your part. When I tell you to do something, you will do it. I don't need to explain myself to you, and if you are somehow caught, you will deny any connection to me to your last breath. Is that clear? And then he blackmails her. He said, if you fail any of my tasks 
or forget to return, I will kill the captain, I'll kill Kaol, then I'll have Nehemia killed, and her brothers executed, and their mother beside them. You get the picture? <laughs> so she's like, yep, I get it, get out. And then we've got Selena and Kaol. He says, well, champion, yes, captain, are you happy now? I may have just signed away my soul, but yes, or as happy as I can be. Do you want to know what your first mission will be? Tell me tomorrow. <laughs> so <laughs> that's the end. I really enjoy this. So I am somewhat downgrading my rating on this. I think when I first read it, I gave it a five star. I'm going to give it four stars. I don't think it's a perfect book, but I do really like it as a start of a series. It's got a lot going on. I think it just reads very young. It reads very YA. It reads very juvenile and melodramatic. But again, I think that's the target audience here and I'm not upset about it. I, I'm kind of okay with it. It was really fun too revisiting these characters when they are still so young and so early in their journey when they have so much growing to do. I'm really surprised at how much lore and world building and Easter eggs and foreshadowing we get in this very first book. I don't know how much of this was planned from the get-go or how much of it was her going back and drawing out the threads of things that she put in book one, but there's a lot in here and it was really fun to go back and read it. Thank you for coming along with me on this journey. I am really excited to continue with the rest of the series and the rest of her books throughout the next year and a half, and I hope you will join me as well. Talk to me in the comments down below. Let me know any of your thoughts on anything I talked about in this video, and let me know if you are revisiting this, what was your experience like? Was it different than the first time, the same? Let me know your thoughts in the comments down below. If you like this video, it always helps if you give it a thumbs up. Subscribe if you want to see more. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.